Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our symposium celebrating 12 year funding uh, of our SFB. And I see a lot of happy faces because this is the first time that we can meet in person again. This is the first event here at our medical center, which uh, I got the special allowance to do this in presence. Uh, obviously, uh, we are all happy that things turned well recently and uh, we all talk about some Delta mutation, but we hope that we come through the summer without uh, further deterioration of our pandemic events. This uh, is a special moment also for me because it's the end of my academic career here at the TUM Medical Center and I'm very happy that we are able to celebrate together and uh, Torsten Gerken put a very nice program together. Uh, not only nice presentations but also uh, I think some very attractive social events. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome especially uh, uh, Gerhard Kramer, who is the Vice President of the University for Research, and uh, we are, uh, spend many hours together in committees on Crimea, and uh, he uh, will give a short talk after me and uh, uh, represent the Technical University. And this is all about this SFB. It was always our aim to generate an interdisciplinary environment in which the different excellent scientists at CTUM are able to collaborate and the SFB was one of the first starting uh, uh, project combining life sciences and technology and imaging and uh, in this case cancer and one of the very nice events during the last few years that this building was also generated by a generous funding which is devoted to translational research in oncology and this is I think a very nice and, and very encouraging building to communicate and to work with each other. Uh, Twelve year funding is uh, uh, associated with a big thank to the German Research Foundation. Uh, you will see the numbers are impressive. Uh, but it's not only that uh, we got the money, but also it was a very pleasant, pleasant uh, cooperation with the administration of the DFG, and we got help and mentorship in many difficult questions. And since we have a hybrid uh, event today, I hope that some of the DFG uh, personnel is on uh, this uh, call or on this webinar. Uh, thank you very much to the DFG for this very generous funding. Second, I'd like to thank all our foreigner guests. It's again, it's a new experience um, traveling and coming uh, to such an event and uh, especially Angelica, uh, Bishop Delois, she uh, served as editor in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and Research and uh, is very supportive in uh, publishing our SFB summary and she will comment uh, I think tomorrow about the rules uh, of this publication. And Ignacio Cario, uh, in the same journal he was a long, how many years, seven years, or editor of the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine and made it to the most prominent imaging journal in, uh, in the world, so to speak. And uh, we have then a number of people who were involved in various positions as reviewers or as advisors, Helmut Mecke from Freiburg, uh, Markus Rudim from the ETH Zürich, and uh, a uh, person uh, I'm very close because Heinz Sherbert is my mentor. He actually is responsible that I switched from cardiology to nuclear medicine. Uh, I spent uh, very important years in 1980s with him at UCLA is one, one of the most enjoyable time uh, had and thank you for this and thank you uh, for coming and uh, joining us here. And uh, 
we noticed that the travel restrictions on the East Coast are very rigid. None of our invited guests from the East Coast, but we got two guests from the West Coast. And Simon Cherry, thank you very much for coming. And we are very much looking forward for your uh, experience with a new PET uh, instrumentation. I don't know where Bernd Pichler is uh, in the very back. Uh, also, uh, and uh, actually product, it was before the SFB, but a product of a, a TUM community. And he is now the dean of the medical faculty in, in Tübingen. And thank you very much for coming. He survived the uh, uh, severe hailstorm yesterday on the way from Tübingen to Munich. So uh, we are happy you made it. <laughs> thank you very much. OK, then uh, we move on. and I give a sh very short summary of the um, uh, 12 years of funding. Uh, I mentioned it's better uh, in person than meeting at Zoom, but I must say as many of these meetings were very productive, and uh, I think it will be also in the future part of our communication. What were the goals of the SFB? It's really to use imaging to bridge biology uh, on patient care. And this was the main motif of this uh, project, which brought us all together. Uh, it clearly depends on innovation and methodology. And I think you will hear now in the next few hours very uh, much what state or how much technology really developed during the last 12 years. It is now possible really to do biochemistry in vivo. It's possible to look at dynamic processes in vivo, or not only in the animal, but uh, definitely also in the patient. The second was uh, obviously having these tools is to identify smart uh, targets, because obviously we want to combine imaging with uh, therapeutic interventions and target and uh, identification of distribution of targets and seeing uh, to generate the biological contrast was of utmost uh, interest. And um, as we then uh, deal in the recent years with very expensive medications and very involved procedures, I think the monitoring of therapeutic effects is uh, of utmost importance to actually individually adapt the regimen, therapeutic regimen. And I think this will also be the topic of our first keynote lecture uh, on the area of personalized, individualized medicine. And I think the, the now uh, term to describe this is precision medicine. And I think imaging is an important part of this. What are the uniqueness of this place here in Munich? I think this was our philosophy that we have to stop the competition between MR, CT, and PET. All of these methods are very attractive, or ultrasound or optical imaging. And I think the experience I most uh, enjoy it most is that we work together. And we're trying to get most out of each imaging modality to uh, meet these challenges I just discussed. And this requires interdisciplinarity. And I think this worked very well uh, in this group of investigators. Thank you much. Thank you very much for all your input. And obviously, uh, one important issue is it's not just imaging. It is to get uh, data which are quantitative in order to really assess changes and to actually uh, create the degree of abnormality in an objective way. And I think this is also uh, very much now supported by this very rapid development of digital methods and algorithms which support the image analysis in a uh, way we hadn't really dreamed of many years ago. The other issue is, and this is what Vasilis uh, always mentioned, is uh, Imaging, cross-sectional imaging in humans has a very lousy resolution, but we want to resolve actually biology and a sub-millimeter resolution. And I think to generate ways to link microscopic imaging with the 
microscopic, supramicroscopic biology is a challenge, and I think there are ways, and you will hear uh, this morning, are ways to get this multi-scale imaging approach. Just now some statistics, uh, uh, start with the money. Uh, we have a total funding of 40 million over the last um, 12 years. Uh, there are about 30 million spent on uh, personnel, which I think is very attractive for the university. And um, what I think a very nice program of the DFG is the Garak program, which allows to employ or take physicians out of the daily routine and allows them to participate in research. And I think this is a very nice instrument which supports the idea of clinician scientists, which we uh, in various forms tried to support in recent years. Obviously, um, uh, the number of projects on PIs uh, was relatively large. For an SFB, we were above 30 principal investigators. We increased the number of females, still the DFG would like to see a higher number. Um, we had a lot of graduations. Um, uh, again, I think the, the number, the gender distribution here was more favorable, and I think in the postdoc area, you already see we're getting this equal number, 50-50 male and female postdocs. So overall, the number is very impressive and helped us really to disseminate uh, this, our methodology, our approach at many levels, and uh, we also took care of the children. I was asking how many children were born in the 12 years. I didn't get the feedback yet. Uh, but we, uh, Torsten was very much uh, interested also to support uh, the daycare of children. So in an emergency, we had all the equipment to deal with children without parents. Good. Um, obviously, when uh, we still uh, see the impact as a major issue of our uh, metric of our publications, we, there uh, were over 500 papers in this um, 12 years, uh, total impact factor over 3,000, and there are just a uh, few papers at the last um, funding period which uh, are in the category uh, high impact factor. And I think this is uh, obviously the most exciting that uh, this is not the impact, but impact factor, but I think it's the impact that we tried. And I think that if you get the level of publication at the journals, which is read by many people outside of your field, you get, uh, we hope to get the recognition that this technology is an important part of modern medicine. Uh, now we are coming to the, um, symposium and uh, the welcome is almost over and I would like to ask Gerhard to continue and we are looking then forward together to a very uh, excellent speaker, Professor Elizabeth de Vries. She will share her experience on personalized, personalized oncology with Simona said. Gerhard. So uh, thank you very much. Um, a few words to start. I prepared the uh, comments I was going to make uh, in German simply because I wasn't sure and because it's safer for me since my um, better language is English. So if I do uh, get stuck once in a while, that's the reason. Um, dear participants, uh, dear Professor Schweiger, dear Marcus, um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the kind invitation to speak here at this um, closing symposium for the SF Bay 824. Um, I gladly did that, also in the hope to learn a little bit about um, what you do here. Uh, and unfortunately, I have to apologize right after I talk. I have to run out because the DFG put a review for a graduierten colleague at 9.45. Um, there should be enough time to do that, but um, otherwise I would, would stay around. Uh, Torsten Gerken asked me to say a few words uh, to begin, also because this is the last academic uh, symposium of uh, Markus Schweiger. And the advantage of getting such a request is that one has the opportunity to, or takes the opportunity to uh, look a little bit into the past of the person and get to know that person a little bit better. 
So I will start with um, his past. He began his path as a, a nuclear medicina, uh, I don't know how you said, nuclear doctor, is that the right expression? It's probably physician, a nuclear physician, um, at, in Munich in 1950. Then he went on to study in medical school in Berlin, uh, Freiburg, and Munich. And then suddenly, in, in, in a few of his biographies, but not in all of them, uh, there appear places such as Peru and Cincinnati. Um, he then went to Los Angeles for four years, and since we do work together in the appointment and tenure board of the Technical University of Munich, I thought, okay, uh, what do, what's the first thing I check? I check the top first authored paper of uh, the person, so I did this, and, and I found the paper, and <laughs> interestingly enough, the second author happens to be here, which was uh, unexpected for me to find out. The title is Sustained Regional Abnormalities, in cardiac metabolism after transient ischemia in the chronic dog model, uh, published in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And the first three words of the abstract are positron emission tomography. <laughs> um, interestingly enough, also I will read the last paragraph, and it fits well because of the um, introductory words you just said. Uh, the very last paragraph says, and it's a cautious paragraph, as you will see in a second. We used only qualitative variables of meta meta metabolic activity in the study. However, the quantitative capabilities of positron, positron emission tomography, especially with the advent of instrumentation with improved image resolution, may enable us in the future to define thresholds of metabolic activity that are predictive for tissue survival or death after ischemia. The predictive value of such metabolic imaging may be of major importance in patients with acute myocardial infarction in order to define salvageable myocardium. So you see he's being very cautious in, in his writing. Uh, and I heard that uh, Professor Shelbert will say a few words, I think, about this paper too, where he can give us a little bit more background. Again, this wasn't planned. <laughs> Just happened to come out that way. Um, yes, um, according to uh, Professor Schweiger's biographies that I did read, his research work on the topic of positron emission tomography uh, helped that method to become a standard method. In 1987, he went to the University of Michigan Ann Arbor for six years where he became a full professor before he came back uh, in German, you say Daheim, in Munich in 1998 to the Deutsches Herzzentrum. And in Munich, he became completely involved, not only in research, but also in supporting the um, local activities at the faculty. He was a study dean for two years, a vice dean for two years, and then became dean of the faculty of medicine for 10 years. And Although he was a dean, he still pulled in a very large and successful SF Bay in 2009. All in the surface of science and the university. And in the same spirit as when things didn't run so perfectly as they sometimes, as sometimes happens in, at the Klinikum, he jumped in again at the end of his career, this time as medical director of the Klinikum Rechts der ISA a role that will end next week. <laughs> um, I pulled out an article from the Süddeutsche Zeitung on this in 2016, and if you read what it says there, it says he didn't wish to comment on his new role, <laughs> which I think uh, fits well with uh, what, we, what I just read um, at the end of the paper. I don't know if he commented publicly on this afterwards or not. <laughs> But it seems clear that the work and the task ahead was more important to him than any type of um, representative role towards the outside. And we, can, we are very thankful that you took on that, this difficult role at that time. Thank you very much. I know that Markus Schweiger is especially proud of one thing, though, and that is the place where we sit right now, the Translatum. This unique interdisciplinary center has 
a lot ahead of it. And it has enormous potential to play a leading role not only in Germany, but also in Europe and the world on the topic of translational oncology. And the university should use this as well as it can to make it successful and more successful. And we should there try to also follow follow the good example that Professor Schweiger uh, set in his career. And I'm also convinced that that will happen. Uh, dear Markus, I'd like to express my appreciation for the research you did, what you did for the Klinikum, what you did for the Technical University over the, these past many years, and also for your uh, role model effect that you also have on the young persons at this location. I think that's wonderful to have persons like yourself. There are other people like yourself here too. This is um, uh, what I think makes the university really successful is people who really care about the place and the people where they are. And now I wish you a uh, very successful symposium, good discussions and good progress in the research ahead. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gareth, for these very kind words. Um, we are a little bit, uh, now we are going remote again, and it's a, a really great pleasure to introduce Professor Elisabeth de Vries. Uh, uh, she is a medical oncologist in uh, Groningen, Netherlands, and is really one of the leading clean oncologists introducing or using concepts of image-guided therapy, and this is an activity which very closely matches the goals of our SFP, so I'm very grateful that uh, Professor de Vries uh, accepted our invitation and will uh, contribute to this symposium. And I think her pioneering work in applying imaging for selecting patient for the best therapy is an example and is a translation of many uh, research project we completed here within the SFB environment. Elizabeth, are you online? I, I hope so. Can you hear me well? We can hear you well. Sorry that you are not here, but we appreciate very much your remote participation. Th thank you so much. Um, and congratulations with this final symposium and this very special day. I, I hope your collaboration uh, will continue. I'm, I'm really sorry that uh, my work for WHO Essential Medicine List, which is just this and next week, prevents me from joining you in person. So about personalized oncology with immunopath. These are my disclosures. What I would like to try to do in my talk is um, give you a bit of background, um, talk about lessons learned from immunopath for imaging with HER2 and growth factor imaging, and then talk about immunopath and immunotherapy. I realized that I may still have turned off my um, view, which might not be kind, so we'll try to repair that. So, so we oncologists at the moment want all tissues, and especially we would like to know all the molecular characteristics of all tumor lesions within a patient, which is, of course, not realistic at all. But we also incre increasingly realize in oncology that there can be heterogeneity in characteristics within a patient, between the different lesions, and between patients. And, and here, PET might help. So when you do immunopet, then you use uh, imaging uh, for 
um, uh, to, to uh, do you use uh, antibodies for imaging. Now, antibodies you all know are highly have a highly specific target recognition and binding. They have a long elimination half life, and therefore it usually takes days if you have a full antibody for to reach an optimal target level. And and in general, they're easy to to label with a radionuclide. This is just to, to visualize to you how we think, for, ex, for example, imaging of the HER2 receptor goes. So the HER2 receptor is present at the cell membrane in a very dynamic way. If you would label an antibody against HER2, like trastuzumab, for example, the zirconium, you would inject it in the patient, then over days, the antibody will travel to its target, HER2, and then it will bind it target. And then the, the antibody and the receptor will internalize, they will degrade, and only the radionuclide will remain intracellular, leading to prominent pictures. So just to tell you what we learned from imaging her, the HER2 receptor on tumor cells, we noticed with indium trastuzumab, so at that time still spiked imaging, that we saw more lesions with this approach than we were aware of with conventional imaging. We also learned that even though patients had received four full therapeutic cycles with trastuzumab, we had not completely saturated the target. We only saw a 20% reduction in uptake in remaining tumor lesions. So we had to realize that there is a constant new production of this receptor. Then zirconium became available, allowing to do PET imaging. Here you see um, day four presence of the tracer in the circulation, but also uptake in tumor lesions, bone metastasis, and even brain metastasis. We then saw that it would be nice to see whether such an approach to imaging with zirconium trastuzumab could help to predict how patients would re respond to what you see at the right top corner. And trastuzumab, a drug uh, at where a, a toxic payload is added, so that's TDM1. So the idea was patients that would show no uptake with trastuzumab also most likely would not benefit from TDM1. Um, this drug is at the moment a, a registered uh, successful drug in patients with metastatic HER2 overexpressing breast cancer. Well, somewhat to our surprise, even though all patients did express HER2 in their tumor, 30% of them didn't show uptake. And it turned out that indeed, in these patients, uh, there was a shorter time to treatment failure than in the patients that did show uptake. We um, saw very prominent in these studies that there can be an enormous heterogeneity in uptake of zirconium trastuzumab across lesions within a patient. Now, you can also use such an approach to study a pharmacodynamic effect. We know that heat shock protein 19 inhibitors reduce HER2 production. And at the left side, you see that in the animal model, we saw low, lower uptake if we did treat the animal with an HSP90 inhibitor. On the right side, you see a picture from a study we, we did together with the Royal Marston, where patients got the same HSP90 inhibitor. And already after two weeks, there was much less uptake of the tracer in the tumor lesion. And it also looked as if holes were occurring. Now, it's all about how meaningful is it for patients. We are currently analyzing this. Um, study in patients with metastatic breast cancer. And we, we have just almost ready the warehouse with all the data. 200 patients. They underwent FDG PET before and early during treatment. They underwent zirconium trastuzumab PET 
and they underwent FASPAT, so the imaging of the estrogen receptor. And the aim of this study is to look whether this imaging upfront can help you to predict how they will respond to their treatment. This is an example of a typical whole body molecular imaging signature we, we get from these uh, patients. This is a patient with a tumor lesion that is overexpressing the estrogen receptor and um, HER2. On the left, you see FDG PET. In the middle, you see the imaging for the estrogen receptor, hardly uptake. And on the right, zirconium trastuzumab, a lot of uptake. So this, this imaging definitely tells you something different than, than the biopsy did. Now, we also wondered whether we could image growth factors. And um, we started to do so by imaging with bevacizumab, an antibody targeting vascular endothelial growth factor A. What you see here is, again, clear uptake in tumor lesions, and um, again, also even uptake in brain metastasis. There is always this discussions where, whether antibodies get into the brain. Um, and that was also the case for the TGF beta antibody, which is currently considered to be very interesting in the immunotherapy area. And we did a study with uh, this antibody labeled in patients with glioblastoma. We saw excellent uptake of the antibody in the tumor. Uh, it was a small study because we did not see responders to this treatment. I now would like to move to immunotherapy. What we can do in the clinic as standard of care is uh, influence the priming phase or the effector phase um, in, in dealing with the tumor. And we can do uh, so in the priming phase by administering a CTL4 antibody. So then we, we uh, take away the inhibitory signal between dendritic cells and T cells, or we can do so at the effector phase by uh, giving an antibody to PD-1 or pd one characteristics. Now, why are we oncologists so excited about immunotherapy? Well, definitely because it turns out that many more tumors can benefit of this treatment than we thought initially, but also because of this phenomenon that we increasingly tend to see that there is what we call in survival curves, a, a plateau in the tail of the curve. You see here at the left data for melanoma, renal cell and non-small cell, years after start of treatment. But at the right side, you see um, our, our best uh, example of um, immunotherapy results, namely in melanoma. The lowest curve is for ipilimumab alone. The next curve, so that's CTO4. Then the next curve is for nivolumab, a PD-1 antibody alone. And the highest curve is for a combination of these drugs. And then you see that after five years, survival is over 50%. And that for a tumor type where until recently, most patients when metastatic disease, when they had metastatic disease, died very rapidly. So we started to label pd one antibody, and it's good to realize that pd one is not only expressed by tumor cells, but also by T cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, et cetera. So you will visualize not only tumor cells. There were a lot of preclinical data here you see data with copper labeled pd one antibody in immune competent mice. They're not tumor bearing. At the left bottom top, you see uh, first uh, data for the wild type mice. And in the middle, when a lot of pd one antibody is administered to block uptake. And uh, next to that, um, mice in which the pd one gene is knocked out. When you look at ex vivo data, then it turned out that the tracer was especially taken up by lymph nodes, the spleen, the thymus, and brown adipose tissue. 
So what does this tell us for the clinic? In general, experiments in mice are done in mice six weeks old. Mice get two years old. Um, individuals in Germany have a very long high life expectancy. So, so the data from the mice, if you compare it, are, are data from toddlers. Now, about our lymphoid tissues and organs. They are so important for immunotherapy, and we do visualize them probably when we image with pd one antibody. It's complex. It contains lymph nodes. It contains the spleen. It contains, on top of the small bowel, the pious pouches, uh, bone marrow. And what do we know about aging? Well, over time, our thymus shrinks. Our lymph nodes um, lose lymphocytes. They get more fibrotic and more, you get more lipomatosis. And then we also learn from these studies that we doctors uh, consider an inflammation uh, when we see, for example, redness or when a patient coughs and produces sputum. But from these studies, we learned that also in the post-resolution phase, when we don't see anything anymore as a doctor, then still the immune system can be involved. We knew when we started the study that if you do a biopsy from one tumor lesion, you stain it for pd one that within that one biopsy, there can already be heterogeneity for pd one expression. So um, with this idea that biopsy only provides information about a small part of one tumor lesion, we started the study. And moreover, we knew that there were patients that did respond to this therapy, even though in the biopsy there was no pd one expression. This was the trial design. Initially, we wanted in part A to figure out the right protein dose and the right moment for PET imaging. And thereafter, patients were treated uh, with atezolizumab, the, the one that we also used for the imaging. And when we would know the right protein dose and the right imaging moment, we would scan the rest patients in, in part B in, in optimal circumstances. We had 22 evaluable patients. They had bladder, non-small cell lung cancer, and triple negative breast cancer. We had to figure out the proper protein dose, and the only data that were available were in a, on, on PK of this antibody were in a supplemental file of the Herbst paper in Nature. And from that paper, we realized that patients with the body weight uh, in, in our area where we live, um, at 10 milligrams might have sufficient antibody um, in the circulation around day four to allow the, the tracer to travel to the tumors. So we started with 10 milligram. And it turned out that the 10 milligram dose really fitted with uh, SUV at day four, which we like from other studies like with trastuzumab and bevacizumab. We're also immediately surprised by high uptake by the spleen. These are uh, typical maximum intensity projections of a patient. Over time, you see this appearance of the tracer from the blood, uh, but high uptake and increasing uptake in tumor lesions and from the beginning, high uptake in the spleen. So what did we saw for normal tissues? High uptake in the spleen, increasing uptake, significant uptake in the bone marrow, and other, uh, otherwise a really normal distribution. Although what was typical for this tracer that in general we did saw, see uptake in lymph nodes and also in the wall dye ring and, and tonsils, so typical sites of uh, lymphocytes. Patients with active inflammation were not allowed in the study, but we have seen several sites of inflammation in these patients where the images told you about a history in the past of inflammation. So now about tumor uptake, major tumor uptake. At the left bottom, you see that within one patient, 
that can already be, for example, for lung lesions, heterogeneity in, in uptake. Here you see tumor uptake in all patients. The patients are sorted on the x-axis and on the y-axis you see the SUV max. The size of the dot indicates the anatomic size of the lesion and the color of the dot tells you where the lesion was located. And basically what you see here is, in general, excellent uptake of the tracer, but there can be major heterogeneity within and between patients. We verified the uptake in the lesion that was biopsied. So the biopsy was done after the PET image. And what we noticed was there was no relation between uptake and PD-1 expression. And moreover, there were quite a number of patients with major uptake in a tumor lesion that showed no PD-1 expression on the biopsy. There was a relation between response of the patients and uptake. When we looked at the individual lesions and those that, that was 107 individual lesions and we looked on the y-axis in the anatomic change in that lesion over time and the time axis is the x-axis, then we noticed that what you see for the color of the lines that the higher the uptake of sircronium trastuzumab was, the higher the chance that the lesion would shrink over time. So drug uptake relates to response of that lesion. We also correlated the, the tumor uptake with progression-free and overall survival. That's what you see on top. So there was a clear relation. And at the bottom, we show you that there is no relation between uptake and pd one staining. So from this study, we learned that there is high uptake of this tracer in the spleen, lymphoid tissues, sites of inflammation, and the tumors in general high uptake, heterogeneity in uptake with presence of visual negative lesions as well, no relation between uptake and pd one expression but there was a relation between tumor uptake, tumor response, progression-free, and overall survival. Now, it's good to realize that such a technique can also be used to help you how modified antibodies behave in patients if you're working in drug development. And we got the opportunity to study pro-body a pro-body for pd one Basically, what that means is that an, a mask is engineered on top of the pd one antibody, and the idea is that the mask is taken off in the tumor microenvironment by proteases, and by, by specific proteases in the tumor microenvironment. We had access to the pro-body molecule to a non-specific probody molecule and to the parenteral pd one antibody. First, we did a study in uh, mice, and on top you see the probody and at the bottom the parenteral um, molecule. And basically, what it shows on the right is that you see good tumor uptake, but less uptake in the spleen with the probody compared to at the bottom um, the parenteral compound. Then we got this molecule um, to um, develop a tracer and do imaging with the tracer and thereafter treat the patient with this drug. You see, again, excellent tumor uptake, but what was, of course, very interesting is what would happen at um, the normal tissue level. Here at the left bottom, you see uptake in the spleen, which is initially high, but after not increasing, a phenomenon we saw uh, with atezolizumab, where we think that that was continuous uptake by lymphoid tissues and probably monocyte macrophages in the spleen. That didn't happen with this molecule. Now, we also labeled 
PD-1 antibody. Now, PD-1 is expressed especially by T cells. So basically what you're visualizing is T cells. We did a similar design. And this is the result for the individual patients. In this study, we included patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and metastatic melanoma. Here is a typical example of an image, again, in general, good uptake in tumor lesions. In this study, also patients with brain metastasis were allowed, and we saw uptake in brain metastasis. And we now also know that patients with brain metastasis can respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. There was no difference in tumor uptake between um, non-small cell lung cancer lesions or melanoma lesions, but we saw higher uptake in lymph nodes, malignant lymph nodes than in uh, brain metastasis. Here, there was again a relation between uptake and progression-free and overall survival. Now, what we medical oncologists want to have is a hot tumor, a tumor with a lot of T cells. But we also know that, that it's not static. We know that pd one expression is not static. We know that presence of T cells is not static. We try to monitor what is happening with blood samples and biopsies, but here imaging might be of interest for the future as well. I, I shared you examples of imaging of PD-1 and PD-1, but also, of course, CD8 uh, activated T cells, imaging activated T cells might be very interesting. And I would like to show you a few data from a presentation at AACR this year, where we used a one-armed antibody. Uh, optical, optimal imaging was day two and four. Here you see results for day two with clear uptake in normal lymphoid tissues like wall dye's ring, lymph node, bone marrow, spleen, and small intestine, but also uptake in a lesion in the breast, in uh, liver met metastasis, but we saw no uptake in the lung lesion where we were aware of that that existed in this patient as well. Now we stained, uh, we did also biopsies in the study. We stained them for CD8. And we noticed what you see on the left, that if there was a desert phenotype, so an empty uh, staining uh, of the tumor tissue for CD8, we saw much less uptake than when there was a stromal or an inflamed phenotype. Moreover, what you see on the right, the, the CD8, positivity in the biopsies correlated with um, presence of radionuclide at the autoradiography of the same specimen. We know in, um, in the clinic that in general patients with mismatch repair deficient tumors have higher CD8 expression. And that's what you see on the left also in our patients less uptake when there was proficient mismatch repair versus deficient mismatch repair. There was a trend to a correlation with response in the middle, and there was a correlation with progression-free survival. We're currently updating these data because we have more data. Moreover, what we are doing with this approach, and we are analyzing that right now, is we do repeat imaging. So we did imaging upfront, and a few weeks after initiation of immune checkpoint inhibition with this idea that it might allow us to see whether we can we have a hot tumor and whether we can make the tumor hot and if not in the future probably other other strategies or additional treatment could be considered so immunopet for personalized oncology um I, I think I tried to show you that it can visualize the distribution and tumor characteristics. It may predict tumor response, it may predict survival, and it provides certainly insight in tumor heterogeneity, pharmacodynamic effects in the tumor, and the immune system, which might be very interesting for the future. 
but you have to realize it's just the beginning and it will require validation and, and cooperation. I would like to thank the multidisciplinary team at home and all our collaborators. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm more than willing to answer questions either in person or, or by mail. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, Elizabeth, thank you very much for your excellent lecture. Maybe I start with one question. Uh, since you showed in most instances immunopets that there is a relation of therapeutic and outcome, what do you think that, or how do you anticipate the development, especially in the drug approval process? Do you believe that there will be this concept of companion diagnostic, actually approving drugs only if you can uh, link it with some imaging uh, parameter or biosignal to to select the right patients, or do you uh, see this uh, as there because it becomes a much more expensive validation process, and it becomes much more complicated for application of the new drugs. I think I see it two ways. Um, in general, the drugs we administer, and especially if we're talking about monoclonal antibodies, then PET imaging may not be cheap, but uh, these treatments are so expensive. So if you could prove that they're not meaningful, then that would be very relevant for the patient. And it would also save a, lo a lot of money if you don't initiate a, an irrelevant drug. I see two potential places. We we now see that many pharma companies and, and, and small groups realize that it might help that if you modify uh, monoclonal antibodies, for example, you make them by specific, that you might really want to know in an early drug development phase where your antibody is going. And because antibodies are clearly different from our classical chemotherapeutic drugs where we just inject it and hope that it hits everywhere. Here there is specific targeting. But if you make a bispecific molecule, it doesn't necessarily mean that it behaves the way you want it to behave, like getting somewhere a T cell and bringing, bringing it to the tumor cell. So there, molecular imaging could clearly help. I think that for um, the implementation as a, a predictive marker, um, it, it can play a role and, and we hope to contribute uh, by large studies we and others are doing. Uh, the, the funding can be an issue to be properly powered. Um, that's one way um, and, and I hope that if it's meaningful or if we can come up with studies that show the relevance of heterogeneity. So probably you don't treat all lesions with this drug and you may have to irradiate a few lesions as well. Then it may turn out to be meaningful. For the immunotherapy area, I think that it might well be that you need more than one marker. So we are currently running a study uh, where we collect whatever we can prospectively in patients that get immunotherapy. And we will add CD8 imaging to that as well. And hopefully that way we can show how uh, CD8 uh, imaging can contribute next to tumor mutational burden, pd one expression, et cetera. But I, I think in, in the clinic, we may have to realize that it may not be one biomarker that is your companion diagnostic for complex um, biology like seen during immunotherapy. Thank you. There is one question from our pathologist. I almost anticipate what he is. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, Professor de Vries, for the great talk. Wilko uh, Weichert, pathologist from the Technical University. One question with respect to your extremely exciting pda one data. Um, because one of the questions we are asking ourselves is always how could the differences between different PE1, PDA1 antibodies in efficacy can be explained? And one of the differences that might be there 
is um, that uptake may be different. So my question would be, is there any way to compare differences in uptake between a labeled Pembro and an Atizo antibody um, in the same patient or in the same preclinical model? Yeah, preclinically, well, the, the, the difficulty in doing that study is that if you label the antibody with zirconium, then it will take you two weeks before you can redo a new image. And, and the point is, do you believe that the situation in that patient is still the same? Um, and that's, of course, the same in, in the animal model where the tumor may change over time. But I think you're right. And we, we could of thinking to compare these things. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any further questions? If this is not the case, again, thank you very much for joining us uh, by mail or by internet, but uh, um, uh, thank you, and um, we will now continue with our I, I hope you have a very enjoyable meeting. Thank person. you. Bye-bye. So, Markus, would you now yeah. take over the moderation? Okay, I hope you can hear me. So my name is Markus Rudin, I'm from, from Zurich. I used to be both at university and ETH, but I'm now retired. But I'm, as with all retired people, they do not just disappear completely, though I'm still active uh, within this academic environment. So it's my great pleasure actually to be here because I was here more than once. And I have now uh, the pleasure to moderate the first session, which is image generation and image analysis. And I would like to introduce the first speaker, which is uh, Professor Simon Cherry from UC Davis. Actually, that's an easy thing because he doesn't need to be introduced because everybody who works in PET and PET technology knows Simon. And even people who are just in the imaging field but not doing PET like myself know Simon. So. He made major contribution, actually, in many aspects with regard to PET technology. I remember the small animal PET. I remember the PET MRI uh, hybrid systems. And of course, now the total body scanners, which are, have been built up, actually, at UC Davis. So Simon is professor at, uh, for biomedical engineering at uh, UC Davis. He is co-director of the Explorer project, which deals with this total body PET scanners, he is British. He did his studies in London at uh, undergraduate at UCL and then his PhD at the University of London in the Institute of Cancer Research. And he was very eagerly followed the game yesterday to see who is playing against England actually in the Euro. It happens to be Germany, but <laughs> so I, I don't think this is a problem for the session today. <laughs> Uh, after his studies in England, he moved to the US, to uh, UCLA, to the Crump Institute, who was a hotspot, of course, for development of nuclear imaging technologies in these days, and probably still is. And he's now done more than 20 years at UC Davis, he told me yesterday, uh, where he's doing his fascinating work on this total body scanner. He got many awards, I will not list them, one which impressed me, of course, he was an elected fellow at the American Academy of, of Inventors. So we are now talking about inventor because also the next speaker is an inventor before we go into the clinical applications. Uh, and it's my great pleasure now to give the word to him and let him speak about this total body PET scanner. Please, Simon. Thank you, uh, Marcus, for that uh, uh, kind introduction. It's, it's great to be back. It's great to be back in Europe. It's great to be back in Germany. And it's great to be back in front of a live audience after many months of, of Zoom presentations. It's nice to actually see some faces. So um, I really appreciate the invitation. I appreciate all the efforts to actually put on a live meeting. Um, it's great, great to be back again. So. Um, 
as, as Mark has said, the um, topic that I want to address today is the development and early use of total body positron emission uh, tomography scanners. Uh, here are my disclosures. So we think about the human body. It's, it's a complex system of interacting tissues, organs, and cells. And the radio tracer method, with its very high sensitivity and systemic injection of radio tracers, ought to be a very powerful tool for studying this complex system. And while the radio tracer method may be uniquely suited to the task of, of systems medicine, our imaging instruments today are really not. Today's PET scanners typically cover 20 to 25 centimeters or so um, of the human body. And of course, we can build up a picture of the entire body, but only by stepping the patient through the scanner uh, section by section. And the problem with that is that our radio tracer is emitting radiation isotropically in all directions. And we only have about one eighth of the body sitting inside the field of view at any moment in time. And even for the part of the body that is inside of the field of view, only a fraction of the emitted photons get collected. So we have radiochemists who labor long and hard to produce radio traces that are specific for biological pathways or targets we want to study. And we throw away more than 99% of that signal when we do a PET scan. So surely we can do better, and of course we can. The other point is that if we want to really use the radio tracer technique to its full, we need to be doing dynamic imaging. We need to be capturing the kinetics of our tracers across the whole body. And again, with today's scanners, you can't do that. You can only look at a small portion of the body dynamically, or if you want to look at the whole body dynamically, you do that with very poor temporal sampling. So these were the motivations behind trying to develop total body PET scanners moving away from a geometry that looks like this to a geometry where we have detectors that cover the entire human body. And the opportunities that that brings are that, of course, now we can see all the organs and tissues of the body simultaneously, and we can collect dynamic information from the entire body. We have high geometric collection efficiency. We collect a lot more signal. And you can estimate, depends what you use as your comparison point, but compared to most conventional scanners, you're getting something like a 20 to 60-fold improvement in signal collection efficiency with a total body geometry such as the one shown here. Now, the opportunities don't come without some pretty significant challenges. So first of all, the scale of the system gets very large, as you'll see. We're talking about many hundreds of thousands of detector elements tens of thousands of channels of electronics that all have to be synchronized within 100 picoseconds or so of each other, large data sets that we have to handle, move around, archive, visualize. And it won't be lost on you that if we've made the scanner a lot bigger and have a lot more detector material, it's going to cost a lot more as well. So we have to ultimately be able to justify that cost. Well, here is the first total body uh, PET-CT scanner. I've just skipped 15 years of development um, that happened. Uh, so this actually predates the, the SFB <laughs> that we're, we're celebrating here today and all the progress. So it's been a long journey uh, to get to this point. We started in 2005 uh, with our first um, uh, concept. But the, the scanner is now a, a reality. It was developed uh, uh, jointly with United Imaging Healthcare. And as I mentioned, it, it's a large scanner. We have a large number of crystals, over half a million individual detector elements, um, and about 54,000 silicon photomultiplier photo detectors to read those out. And we're actually measuring about 92 billion different lines of response simultaneously through the human body. So in terms of the opening of the scanner, it's, 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 it's a pretty standard uh, ring diameter. But the real standout here is the axial field of view, almost two meters long to cover uh, the entire human body, except perhaps for some very tall basketball players. Um, it also has a CT scanner on the front. It's a fairly high-end uh, CT scanner. Um, and then in terms of performance, if we use the standard performance metrics with which we uh, tend to compare our, our scanners and measure their performance, as, 
as you would expect, the standout performance is the sensitivity, which is very, very high here compared to conventional scanners. But also, because we collect a lot more signal, it allows us to reconstruct our images at, at quite a bit higher spatial resolution. And so we use fairly small detector elements uh, in the scanner so we can realize that resolution. So we're now at under three millimeter spatial resolution. It's a time of flight system with just under 500 picoseconds time of flight. And I'll just show you a quick video here to show you how the system's comprised, starting with an individual crystal, two and three quarter millimeters on a side, 18 millimeters deep, built up into arrays. And then each of those arrays is read out by four silicon photomultipliers. Those are then built into panels, as you see here. And then there are 24 of those panels that form a single unit. And then that unit is replicated another seven times to create the entire scanner. And then there's a CT scanner on the front. And so that's what's inside the system. Now, just to give you some context of the scale here, on the left-hand side, you see a couple of photographs of the system as it was being um, built. And on the bottom, you see some of the specs. And on the right-hand side, you see the CMS calorimeter at CERN, one of the big physics detectors at CERN. And if you compare the number of, of, of crystals, the number of detectors, the number of electronic channels, very similar in scale. So we're talking about medical imaging devices now that have a similar complexity to the detectors that have been used in high-energy physics uh, for quite a while. A question I often get asked is why we push to make the scanner two meters in length. Because you might argue that for most applications, all we're interested in is perhaps from the brain to the pelvis. And you don't need two meters of scanner for that, or do you? So here's a conventional scanner, covers only a small part of the body. And the important thing to realize here is that if you plot the sensitivity profile across the axial field of view, it peaks in the center. And that's just because of the geometry, the collection geometry for, for the photons. So at the very edges of the field of view, you don't have very good sensitivity, which is why when you do a whole body study, you overlap the bed positions um, so that you can get reasonably uniform sensitivity. So for sure, I could build a scanner that's on the order of, of a meter or just over a meter long. And you would then cover all the major organs of the body, as shown here. The problem is that, again, the sensitivity peaks towards the center and is very low at the edges. And guess what? You have two pretty important uh, regions of the body towards the edge of the field of view. You have the brain at one edge, where my collection efficiency, as you can see there by the red region, is very, very poor. And then down in the pelvis, you have the same problem at the other end as well. So while you'll get good sensitivity across the thorax and across the upper parts of the abdomen with this kind of geometry, you're going to be struggling for counts again in the brain and in the pelvis unless you do multiple bed positions. And the whole point here is to get away from multiple bed positions so we can do good dynamics across the entire body. So if we go to two meters in length now, and you'll see that the, the patient's actually positioned here with their feet sticking out the scanner. We've positioned the major organs in the center of the scanner where the sensitivity is the highest, as given by that dashed line. We actually don't collect the most oblique lines of response because they're very heavily attenuated. They pass through a lot of tissue. So we tend to restrict the acceptance angle so that we get a sensitivity profile that's shown by the, the solid line there. And what you'll see now is that we still have excellent collection efficiency for the brain and for the pelvis. So now we've got very good sensitivity across all the major organs of the body. And that's why you need a scanner that's approaching two meters in length. So in conventional PET, we are somewhat limited in our parameter space if we want to get good image quality. We're obviously, obviously as you increase the scan length or you increase dose, you collect more photons, you get better quality images. But of course, there are practical limits to both dose and to scan time. And so we tend to be operating up in this, in this, in this uh, sector shown in, in the darker blue here. And it's a pretty narrow space where we can operate and get good image quality. What Total Body Pet does is it dramatically increases that parameter space, allowing us many different possibilities for trading off dose, scan time, and image quality. 
because we're getting effectively 40 times or so more signal for imaging the whole body, we can use that to get much better quality images. We can use it to image much more quickly if we wish, or we could use it to follow our radio traces for longer in time as they decay. So we have a much bigger window over which to follow our radio traces. Or we can use this increase in signal collection to dramatically reduce the administered dose. And so that's what I mean by this increase in parameter space. We can image more quickly. We can image at lower dose. We can image with higher signal noise ratio. We have a lot of choices to tailor the protocol to the question at hand. So in terms of applications, of course, this, this kind of system is best suited for, su for studying systemic diseases and therapies. And we all already heard beautifully in the previous presentation from Professor De Vries some of the applications in oncology and in Im immunoimaging. And you can extend those kinds of paradigms to thinking about infectious disease as well, of course, looking at inflammation throughout the body, cellular-based therapies, and an increasing understanding and interest in studying the interactions between different organs in the body, for example, mind-body interactions. Being able to do total body pharmacokinetics, of course, is very attractive as well. We have a lot of interest from the pharma industry, not surprisingly, but also in toxicological research and in looking, at, looking for new biomarkers. And then the low-dose um, opportunities gives us a chance to use PET in some areas where it's been difficult to use PET in the past. So obviously, you, know, you won't be surprised that we're, we're looking to expand the use in the pediatric population. But also using PET to study chronic disease. You know, in people that are perhaps fairly young, um, otherwise fairly healthy, diabetes might be a good example of this, where you might want to track the time course and the evolution of that disease in response to different interventions over many, many years with, with multiple scans. And you really like to keep the dosimetry very favorable for that. And also, of course, for studying normal human biology. So um, the, the scanner was uh, completed in uh, late 2018 and was installed actually almost exactly two years ago at UC Davis. And this was our first scan on June 20th, uh, 2019. And right out of the box, we got very, very nice images. This was the very first study we, we did. So this is a maximum intensity projection. This is FDG, pretty standard dose of about 350 megabacarels here, uh, imaging about 90 minutes uh, post-injection. If we look at some of the cross-sectional images, just lots of rich detail that we can, we can see here. Um, and, and so this was a very encouraging uh, first study. So um, just to give you a sense of where we are to date in the two years we've had the system, we've done um, just slightly more than 1,150 clinical studies. So the system set up that we use about half the time, ideally we'd use half the time for clinical studies, half the time for research. COVID has very much interfered with that plan on the research side. We were shut down for research for uh, quite a few months, and then it took a while to reactivate our trials again, again once we did reopen for research back in March. So we currently have uh, 12 active trials going on on the scanner with seven different traces in a, in a range of different disease areas, um, as you can see. On the clinical side, our protocol is perhaps a little different um, than you might expect. Um, so we're, we're, we're injecting a fairly standard amount, slightly less than we, we, we do on our conventional scanners, about 300 megabacterials of FDG. But we have a two-hour uptake time. And I'll talk more about that in, in, in a few moments, except for our lymphoma cases, which we also scan at 60 minutes. And we keep that scan time quite long, 20 minutes. And that's because our physicians really love the very good image quality. They don't want to compromise on that for throughput. And uh, so it, it's been interesting to see that um, actually not just our physicians, but even our administrators have been supportive of not pushing for high throughput on this very expensive machine, but rather going for the best quality images to best serve our patients. Um, so I'll show you just um, a, a few um, snapshots from our clinical studies and some of the challenges and opportunities in the clinical space. So this is a flu cyclovine study which highlights the um, interest in having high spatial resolution. So this is a case where there's a very small two and a half millimeter nodule that you can see on the CT scan here. 
where we can also clearly see uptake of, of flucyclovine in that nodule on the, on the PET scan. One area where we've found that we've had a dramatic improvement in image quality, which is particularly relevant perhaps in the United States, is that we have a lot of obese patients. And in general, we struggle to get good image quality in those patients uh, because of the very high amount of attenuation and scatter. But on this scanner, because we have a lot of signal, we're, we're finding we're able to get very nice quality images, even in our largest subjects. Pediatric imaging is obviously an area that we're spending quite a bit of time exploring. And it's interesting here because you have, um, you have different opportunities and different needs. So um, here's a five-year-old uh, child who weighs about 10 kilograms, was injected with about 85 mega, mega becquerels of FDG. We scanned them for 20 minutes, but we also extracted from that what would happen for shorter scan times. And that's important because there are quite a few pediatric subjects that are not able to stay still for very long without sedation or anesthesia. And anesthesia carries significant risk, and so we'd like to avoid the need to anesthetize children for PET scans. And you can see that we can get the acquisition time down very short on this scanner uh, before the image quality starts to degrade. So this was a, a child with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so even at you know, 75 seconds or so, we get pretty good scan quality. So working with our child life specialists, if we can get a child to be still from the order of a minute or so, and we can, of course, be acquiring data for multiple minutes, we just need them to be still for one minute of that or so, we can get a very good quality scan um, in, in, those, in those kids. Of course, the alternative is, if you have children that are able to stay still, then you can reduce the dose. So another way of looking at this data set is that it corresponds, the times also correspond to what you would get with different doses injected. So in kids that get a lot of scans, because we're following the trajectory of their disease, we could definitely reduce the dose down to just a few megabecquerels if they're able to stay still. So here's a nice example of where we can tailor the protocol in terms of time and dose to the needs of the individual child. Another interesting finding we've had is um, some of our flucyclovine studies because um, we've got the whole body and the field of view at the same time. We're actually able to see the different kinetics um, across the whole body. On conventional scanners with flucyclovine, the conventional wisdom is um, you start down in the pelvis because you're typically looking for prostate lesions, and then you move from the pelvis up to the rest of the body as time progresses to look for, for metastases. Now, in this particular patient, at four minutes or so, which is on a conventional scanner where you'd be looking in the pelvis, we don't see anything remarkable at all, neither at six minutes or at eight minutes. But at about 10 minutes, we start to see something appearing here, which becomes more and more prominent over time. If we'd done this study on a conventional scanner, we would have missed this because we would not have been looking in this part of the body at those late time points. So the point here is that we can accommodate different kinetics. We don't need to know the kinetics ahead of time. We can accommodate the heterogeneity of kinetics of our traces because we can see everything and be watching it the entire time. Now, there are clearly some challenges as well as perhaps opportunities in using total body PET clinically. One of the big challenges we've had is that we have higher spatial resolution images now. We're typically reconstructing at around three millimeter resolution. And so we're seeing things that we're not used to seeing in PET scans. We see the, the spinal cord very nicely. We see the vessel walls very nicely. We see the pituitary gland, the adrenals. They all have pretty high SUV values. You know, what's normal, what's not normal? This is something where we're having to recalibrate ourselves. And then there's things like this, where you see this little small hot spot in, in the liver. No CT correlate. Is that a false positive? We, we have no way to know. But the fact we can see a lot more brings with it a, a certain a challenge from the clinical side and certainly from the reading perspective. We've increased our uptake time because we have plenty of signal. And so if we wait longer, we know that lesion contrast tends to go up with time. Blood clearance, of course, um, uh, helps if we wait longer. And so we've gone to a standard 120-minute uptake time for all of our clinical studies, which again gives us very nice images, but 
there's a workflow issue, right? Because now you have to have more uptake rooms to support those longer uptake times. And then another issue is with this high spatial resolution, we can reconstruct on smaller voxel sizes. So we can go to, for example, just over one millimeter voxel shown on the right-hand side. There's a very small uh, sclerotic uh, lesion in the CT scan on this, on this patient. Um, this is actually a lung cancer patient, I believe, um, after therapy. And we see on the PET scan, we can see on the high resolution image, we can see just a small area of FDG deficiency that corresponds with that lesion on, on the CT. Can't really see it on the larger voxel size. But now with these small voxels, we have 1,600 slices that a nuclear medicine physician has to go through and read. So the workload to, to look at these very large data sets is obviously quite significant. So these are some of the interesting questions that come up about how you use this technology clinically. Now, low dose is not only of interest in the pediatric setting. If we want to expand the use of PET into some research applications, where we might be more dose sensitive, so studying normal biology, studying you know, chronic disease in younger individuals who have long life expectancy ahead of them. Um, you know, it's a very different regime than studying cancer in elderly patients. So there are many applications where we'd like to keep the dose low. So this is an FDG scan with just 20 megabecquerels injected in a fairly large subject, almost two meters tall, over 100 kilos. And you can see that with a 20-minute scan, even with this very low dose, about 1 20th of our standard dose, we can get pretty good quality images. And this has been very helpful, for example, in studying rheumatoid arthritis. We have a number of trials going on in, the, in this area. This is a great tool uh, for looking at arthritis. We can see all the joints in the body at the same time. We can ad acquire data kinetically. Um, as well, so we can do kinetic modeling on all of this. The high resolution is great here because we can look down to the individual joints in the fingers and the toes, for example, in these different forms of arthritis, and we can keep the dose very low as well. And these are people that are getting repeat scans, following their disease, following different interventions. And here's another study where we're, we're fairly dose sensitive, and this is uh, brand new data just from uh, a, a few weeks ago. So this is a zirconium-labeled antibody that's directed against uh, CD8-positive uh, T cells. And so here we're injecting uh, just 20 megabecquerels of this uh, labeled uh, antibody. It's actually a mini body. And are looking at this in COVID-19 patients. And these patients will actually come back. So th these are within a few weeks of their initial uh, infection. They will come back again for another repeat study follow-up study at about four months um, out. So this was our very first uh, subject. You see lots of interesting uptake in, in, the, in, the, in the lymph nodes here, spleen, bone marrow, bowel, and um, so, um, and we also have some kinetic data in, in our second subject that we just did um, last week. So this is a new trial that just got off the ground uh, very recently. Unfortunately, it took so long to get approved, and now, of course, it's hard to find COVID patients, but. Um, we've, we've recruited three, and we're looking for three more. So, um, and I should have mentioned, I think, you know, zirconium is definitely an area where we're very dose sensitive. Again, it's a little different than the oncology um, paradigm that we just uh, heard about from, uh, from Dr. DeVries in the previous presentation, because here we're looking at, you know, people with an infection. Some of our subjects are quite young, and, you know, zirconium gives a fairly considerable dose. And so being able to drop the dose way down, as we've done here, allows us to keep the dose low for an individual study, but also to be able to do multiple studies in an individual to follow the time course. The other area we spend a lot of time um, studying is fast imaging, you know, using the kinetics. Um, and so here's a 20-minute scan, here's a one-minute scan. Yes, not as good, obviously, because we have 1 20th of the, of the signal to deal with. But even at 30 seconds, we can get a fairly good scan of the entire human body. So I think many of you have seen this video before. So now pushing this down to sort of one second uh, temporal resolution, we can actually now watch as we inject our bolus of radio tracer into the human body. And we can watch as that tracer distributes um, throughout all the organs and tissues of, of, of the body. And so this now really allows us to 
developed this, this concept of total body pharmacokinetics and kinetic modeling. So we have time activity curves, not just from every organ in the body, but even at a voxel level. We have a good enough signal to noise in many cases that we can plot the time activity curves for every voxel. And of course, we've always got the blood pool in the field of view, so we can always get an input function for our kinetic modeling as well. And that's shown here. If I look at some individual one second frames, two seconds apart, we see the vasculature very nicely. You can easily define a region of interest, for example, on the descending aorta to use as your blood input function. And in fact, we can even, if we put regions on different vessels, we can see the difference in arrival time of the bolus at the different organs as well. And so we can actually map that throughout the body. And on a voxel by voxel basis, we can ask the question, at what time did the bolus arrive at that particular voxel? And that's a parameter we need to put into our kinetic model. So it's very nice to be able to measure that. And so we can bring all these pieces together now to do total body parametric imaging, where we compute a, a parameter on a voxel by voxel basis across the whole human body. And so the example I'll show here is using FDG. This is a patient with metastatic kidney disease. And so on the left-hand side, you see a parametric map of KI, um, which is the overall FDG influx rate. People do this on conventional scanners as well. Uh, using the PATLAC approach, so perhaps nothing too exciting about that. But we can also pull out the individual uh, microparameters as well, such as K1 that's shown on the right-hand side. This you can't do on a regular scanner. Um, and then we've also got the fractional blood volume shown in the middle there. So from one dynamic sequence, we can pull out multiple different parametric maps. And if we compare that with the SUV image, which is what we typically use, a number of things immediately jump out at you. If you look at the liver, for example, on the KI image, of course, you, you, you reduce the, the, the liver background nicely so you can see the lesions better. And on the K1 image, we can see, um, see this hotspot very clearly, whereas on the SUV image, it's very hard to discern because of the high surrounding brain activity. Now, if we can do one second frames, can we go even faster? So on the left-hand side, now we're at 100 millisecond frames which allows us to get at some of the really fast vascular dynamics. And so what you're seeing here is an injection up through the leg, 100 millisecond frames. So we're not averaging anything here. You're seeing frame by frame as the blood enters, the right ventricle gets pumped to the lungs, comes back to the left ventricle, and then gets distributed throughout the body. And if you put a, time, if you put a region of interest over um, the vessels, you will see some structure in there now. You see these oscillations. You see these step functions. And that's, of course, because of the cardiac cycle. So we're actually able to monitor each individual heartbeat. So you could imagine now being able to gate off each individual heartbeat. And we can produce images like this where we're not averaging like we typically do when we do a gated PET study. You're actually watching each individual heartbeat here over a period of about uh, 10 seconds. So how we're going to use this, what we can use it for yet. I think there are, there are open questions there. But we can really get at some of these fast vascular dynamics now. And it'll be interesting to think about what kind of traces we might, might want to use, perfusion traces, blood volume traces, what kind of interventions and stimuli you might be able to use as well. <clears throat> so one of the big methodological challenges for doing all of this and particularly for doing total body parametric imaging, which I think is one of the really big research areas for using this tool, is motion. People move all the time. And if we're acquiring dynamic images over 60, 90 minutes, there's a lot of motion going on. So I'm showing a couple of flu cyclovine studies there, which I'm not playing right now. Let me go back, see if I can get these, to, these movies to play. Uh, I don't know if at the back you could make these movies play, possibly, on the left-hand side. Those should both be moving. It's a shame you can't see the movie because the one in the, uh, the second from the uh, left looks like the person's talking. In fact, they are talking to the uh, technologist during the scan. And you can see their mouth moving. I can show it to those of you that are here during the break if you want to see it. So we have lots of motion. We have cardiac motion. We have respiratory motion. We have internal motion, such as the bladder filling. And of course, then we have involuntary movement, which you would have seen in these videos with the arms moving and the mouth moving. 
So to, to find a comprehensive way to correct all, the, all this is not easy. But again, because we can acquire data very quickly, um, there is the possibility that we can track all of this motion during the scan and correct for it. So on the top, I show an unprocessed one second frame over the, uh, over the thorax and abdomen. And it's very noisy, it's only one second of data. But if we use um, denoising techniques, deep uh, learning based um, denoising techniques, we can dramatically uh, reduce the noise level and we can get the outlines of the organs and we can quite clearly now track the motion that's going on at one second temporal resolution. Now to do that across a whole 60 minutes and actually correct for that motion, long way off being able to do that. But certainly some of the pieces and some of the approaches to do that are coming into place. So this is sort of a summary slide of what we've done so far with the scanner. We've had nine different tracers going to, going to people with total body PET, um, a range of different uh, isotopes, a range of different applications. We're not the only long axial field of view scanner around now. There's competition, which is great to see. So um, our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania have built a 140 centimeter long system that has very good time of flight uh, performance. And then, as many of you know, there's the Siemens Vision Quadra scanner, which is just over a meter long, uh, that's recently uh, been produced and is being distributed, which has outstanding time of flight performance at 225 picoseconds. So we, we're gonna see a range of these kinds of scanners that can do the sorts of things that I've been talking about today in the field. And so, in summary, these scanners now exist. There's a lot of work going on to, to, to figure out how to handle some of the methodological challenges around large data, motion, and total body kinetic modeling. But of course, the most important thing eventually, especially given the cost of these systems, is to develop and demonstrate impactful applications, both in the clinical space and in the research space. As you can imagine, this 15-year project involved a lot of people. Um, so I'd like to, to thank all my colleagues at UC Davis who contributed to this and also the very large team at United Imaging Healthcare who helped to design and build the scanner. And particularly my colleague, Ramsey Badawi, who has co-led this project with me from the very start in 2005 and who deserves equal praise or criticism for this presentation. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, thank you, Simon, for an outstanding lecture. Uh, I'm didn't monitor the field too closely, and I was really actually blown away by the quality of those images. Uh, there, well, we don't have too much time for questions, unfortunately, but the, I'm sure there's one urgent question from the audience. Well, just ask, because we don't. Yeah, of, of course, that's the hope that we can, we can see things a lot earlier. Of course, you know, you need people to present earlier as well, which is, you know, I think one, one, of, the, one of the challenges. And obviously the cost here is, is, is not something that's gonna lead you towards a screening environment. So you're gonna need to have, you know, a population that's at high risk for some reason that you, that you may want to look at early. So I think there are, there are some niche areas where you could imagine that, that playing out. Um, but, but we'll have to see. But you could imagine perhaps in tandem with other much more cheaper tests that might indicate that um, you, you, you should do an imaging screening test. So for example, if we had a blood test that was readily available for screening, indicated there might be a problem, and then in those people, you would go in perhaps and look for early signs of disease. That, that might be a more reasonable way to approach it. T time will tell. Thank you. Thank I you. mean, I hate Interrupting discussions, long, but, but, but <laughs> no, uh, there will be opportunities in the break, I suppose, and during the day to ask questions to Simon. So thanks a lot for an outstanding lecture. So the next speaker, which I'd like to introduce, uh, well, you know him all very well, Vasilis Tsiakristos from TUM and from the Helmholtz Institute. He's a pioneer in, if I quote him, looking and listening to light. Uh, he's an electrical engineer by training did his studies in Thessaloniki, then moved to Pennsylvania, and then to MGH, where he first met about 
probably 20, 25 years ago. And then in, in 2007, I think he came to Munich to take this new position in Munich. He also received many awards, and one award which of course is of relevance for this lecture here is the German Innovator Award for, award for, for MSOT, which is the topic of today. So the lecture is about clinical investigations on, on the use of MSOT for evaluating the effects of NIA and therapy in cancer. Please, Vasilis. All right, thank you very much, Marcus, for the kind words and also for the support over the years. Uh, for me, obviously, as Marcus indicated, the SFB somehow relates to Translatum. The, the applications were done at the same time and somehow they have this common route. Now, uh, in terms of optoacoustics, um, an interesting thing, two years ago we found out that we could measure uh, environmental parameters as well. Now, this year there's supposed to be the launch from the EU of the Euro 7. This is a new emission standard. And we're finding out that our sensors can uh, be made portable and can be used for that application too. So I was supposed to be in Thessaloniki today uh, for, because we run two projects, one for measurements in uh, automobiles, and actually the other, which is very exciting, on measurements on uh, large ships because they seem to be polluting a lot the environment. Now, um, with switching from virtual to real, you realize that you have to rethink how you schedule meetings because uh, you can be somewhere and still be part of another meeting if all is virtual, but I hadn't realized that this is in person. But uh, thankfully, I rescheduled. Uh, unfortunately, I can be here only this morning. I have to still leave, uh, and I will miss the nice social function with all of you, but it's really nice to see everybody in person again. Now, uh, in terms of the proposal, you know, this entire thing happened when we were we were starting visualizing uh, molecular activity with fluorescence. Uh, you see a tumor there, this red signal is cathepsin activity, inflammation in the lung. We had a company um, that takes it to Perkin Elmer to commercialize this um, uh, uh, fluorescence machines. And back then we also had um, uh, introducing this hybrid FMT XCT, so fluorescence tomography together with X-ray CT. Um, and there was a nice workshop here at uh, TUM, let me see, uh, over here, and that was a device that had both the fluorescence camera and the X-ray uh, CT kind of axis here. So we had started taking nice images already. So we had the anatomical registration, and we could put that molecular signal, so it started looking like PET CT or SPEC CT, but using fluorochromes, which is very exciting. Um, we also started, uh, had started publishing some papers within the SFB now with uh, Gabriele Muthoff here, two papers already, early papers. In parallel, um, we sta have started collaborating with uh, Franz Pfeiffer. He had developed this phase contrast CT that was giving much better contrast. So, in fact, we ended up having a phase contrast CT FMT. And the interesting thing here is because you see much more activity, we could model light propagation better, so our fluorescence imaging were getting even more accurate. And we were confirming these results with this cryo slicing, and you could see we had very good correspondence in finding here, I believe, pancreatic cancer using a, a targeting AB beta 3 integrin. Now, this also became very interesting because essentially what we had was a cryo slicer. We had put a camera here, and we could slice through an entire tissue or animal and we could nicely have color images, but also at different wavelengths, the distribution of different fluorochromes. So we could see vascular structure here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is just an intrinsic excitation image. It doesn't matter. Well, you could see the, um, the fluorescence distribution very nicely. So we could um, see by a distribution in high resolution, uh, and we could start seeing how, for example, nanoparticles were uh, delivering in tumors and so on. So we also started putting this into SFB, in this case more as a, a core facility. Um, and in fact, uh, this is just an example in collaboration with Angela, where um, we, we started uh, doing a co sort of like essentially visualization of um, tumor reactive T cells that they were expressing fluorescence. We developed spectral and mixing techniques to decompose contributions from autofluorescence, for example, from food, from the actual activity from the cells. And uh, at the end, we also confirmed this with PET. 
and we, we got a very nice correspondence between the two modalities. So essentially, we made that part of the core of the SFB, so anybody that used fluorescence could cryoslice and see in high detail how the fluorescence distributes in the tissues. And this is just an example of other studies, uh, a few papers published here, um, also uh, on, on brown fat, but uh, importantly also with, uh, with uh, cancer as well. So, supported by the SFB, and I'm, I, as you realize, I'm doing a little bit of historical kind of uh, um, uh, story here, um, follow-up. Um, we developed an endoscope um, in order to start visualizing endoscopically these fluorescent signals. Um, and uh, this is, uh, in fact, camera supported by the SFB. They built this uh, SFB, and together with Dieter Sauer and Angelica Snicker, we went and did uh, imaging in pigs, in their beautiful animal models. And in fact, that was done in collaboration with the Stanford team. Um, and uh, we published two papers from this on visualizing uh, lesions, essentially uh, small lesions using fluorescence uh, endoscopy with different agents. This was fluorescence nanoparticles for colorectal uh, cancer. And that was a protease-activated probe. But essentially, in both cases, we saw something that we're also pursuing outside the SFB with different funding on trying to get fluorescence to get, uh, se um, detect earlier cancer during endoscopies. Now, this is something that I regret we did not follow that story, and it's an open question to everybody in the room and beyond, because using this fluorescence, we were also seeing something else. We're very much in favor of early detection. And we have shown in this previous work, um, in this slide here, another work that I'm not showing, that we can see early lesions using this fluorescent agent. So when you do endoscopy, uh, it is uh, sort of like reasonable, and we're showing this in many studies now, that we can see earlier than white light endoscopy. But we were observing also something else. That is a study we were doing uh, before I came here in Boston. Um, we were trying to develop tomographic techniques again, and in this particular case, that is this PNS paper, um, we were trying to show that we could see with fluorescence tumors, lung tumors, um, in the lung of mice. That was a spontaneous uh, lung tumor. And so in, when we had controls, uh, we had very little fluorescent signal. But in fact, when we had a tumor, we could see the tumor, so that was you know, great because we could show that we, we could tomographically uh, localize these tumors with fluorescence, but what we consistently saw was signal also on the contralateral side. And we said, all right, I mean, we're not getting signal just from the primary tumor. We're seeing signal from the entire lung. And of course, histologically, this would look different than normal. So we started under the SFB now. We designed a study and said, well, that might be because this is already very developed. What happens early on? So we designed a study that we started injecting probes before we had uh, an anticipation with, before these tumors would develop in a, in a transgenic animal of, of, of cancer. And we started seeing increased fluorescent signals. I don't know how I can point now to um, um, here. This is um, control, and this is now the wild type animal, but before lesions appear. And we could consistently get even a two week old animals differences of background fluorescence. So in my mind, it was always be that there are changes, you know, along this field cancerization that could potentially be detected even if there is not a lesion just by changes in the entire organ. Um, it's a little bit of, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a concept that has uh, propagated a lot in the cancer field, although there are always these talks. I don't think there's a systematic study. We still not use this for early diagnostics, but there is a good potential. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not an oncologist myself to follow this up at the clinical level, but I think there might be something there and hopefully we'll be able to, to see uh, more results on this soon. Now, in terms of optoacoustics, um, optoacoustics, obviously, it's a very old method. It goes back to uh, 1880, uh, but more, uh, it comes here to, to, to the 30s and 40s and 50s. People were using optoacoustics, as you see, for gas analytics. 
what we have done over the years and pretty much in parallel with the SFB itself, we were developing different technologies, a different sort of um, um, number of channels and tuning speeds for the laser and so on. So evolving the technology, both for small animal and clinical applications. With this company, Aethera Medical, that I have financial interest in, um, this technology now has been placed all around the world. It produces a lot of study independently of us, which is always exciting. It started appearing now in the, the media. The good thing is that very recently we got a CE mark for the clinical system. This is a handheld system. It contains ultras it has ultrasound and optoacoustic imaging, and still sort of have uh, uh, sort of publishing on the technology, but more importantly, we're looking at what sort of applications we can now um, uh, impart with this new uh, modality. And you can see already there are some high-level publications done on this platform, um, and I, we're very excited. Uh, we just want to find out if, at the end of the day, something like this will ever end the clinics. And this is where uh, a lot of the research goes now. So the animal imaging, uh, you know these slides. Uh, these are the old sort of uh, small animal imaging with this type of geometry. The animal goes here. It gets illuminated. And you have the ultrasound detector uh, on the back detecting the uh, signals. And we had also the handheld scanner. Um, and a, a very interesting and important feature here is the spectral ability. So we illuminate at multiple wavelengths, and we unmix the absorptions of different molecules. So in a way, we can do molecular imaging, and we can do it also label-free. We can use contrast agents, but we can go and see oxy deoxyhemoglobin, lipids, water, and so on. We developed methods to truly produce tissue oxygenation maps, label-free, by resolving oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So we can take images of oxygenation, uh, not only you know, arterial oxygenation or something like this. We showed how the quality now, uh, within a decade, we went from these optical images that they're very diffusive to high-resolution optical images for the first time. So this is certainly kind of a, a step function improvement here in the sense that we we have gone for very low resolution inaccurate surface observation to three-dimensional high resolution observations. And very kind of briefly now as an outline, as I mentioned, this platform, especially the clinical platform, has started generating some interesting um, work in the clinics too. For example, we are showing that we can see metabolism, and in particular aerobic metabolism, because we take oxy and deoxyhemoglobin and calculate the rate of exchange from oxy to deoxy. In that respect, optoacoustics might be the only method that visualizes aerobic metabolism. And it's very interesting to combine then with glucose metabolism, other forms of metabolism from MR as well, um, that contain anaerobic, uh, you know, general, and, um, and, and uh, do combined studies. Nevertheless, in this sort of publications, we show how we could see activation, for example, in the brown fat in humans, label-free, because we can see this oxy to deoxy exchange rate. And uh, we compare that with PET as well. And as you see, MSOT has good resolution. We can see the muscle here in uh, the subclavicular clav area and the fat over here, which um, we can also see its activations. Now, other people, this is our studies from Erlangen, they took our system, and they saw inflammation in the gut. This is the ultrasound part of this hybrid system. And then this color is the total blood volume. That essentially, when you have your total blood volume going up, there was a good correlation with inflammation. This was published here. And in this publication, they also applied this to muscular dystrophy. And as part of this um, SFB, we thought of interrogating what is the value of a method like this for breast cancer imaging. Again, we have a technology that does ultrasound, and on it we add the optoacoustic. So the question is, ultrasound is already used in, in radiology. Would we actually deliver something on top of it by using this hybrid approach? So one thing we know for sure is we can see vasculature, angiogenesis, and this is a representative, let's say, image where the ultrasound will see this lesion here, hypoechoic, um, and the optoacoustic is very different. It has the vascular signal. We can see also hypoxia and so on. So it's an interesting uh, interrogation. We have started now scanning uh, uh, different people. We also see the fat and water content, uh, ad radiology, 
um, um, so uh, with, uh, with the radiology colleagues there that they provide a lot of support and we're very appreciative of it and we see these different patterns. I want to show you um, where we are image quality. So this is the best we have right now. So after many years of developments for the handheld, obviously handheld is not a Simon showed full body tomography that you get all of the projections. You only get a piece of the information. So you have to apply a lot of good uh, inversion mathematics and, and processing in order to, to have good image quality. This is where we are. This is sort of like the state of the art of optoacoustics right now. This is the ultrasound image. Um, and this is the corresponding optoacoustic image. You see vasculature surrounding the tumor. We see this pattern often. Uh, sometimes we see a lot of agiogenesis going uh, a very dense vascular network just around the tumor. Sometimes we see large blood vessels coming from centimeters apart into the tumor. This is very typical. The oxygenation signal, I can tell you, up to now have not shown um, diagnostic accuracy, but we are recruiting patients. It goes a little bit slow, and with COVID, it slowed down further, but we are recruiting patients to see how oxygenation can predict uh, outcome after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and very quickly, I don't know, I maybe have maybe uh, three more minutes. Um, with Tilo Biderman, we take this technology at higher frequency, and we can see the depth of melanoma. I think this is the best performance. We actually see individual uh, melanoma cells here. And we have a technique. I don't think there exists another technique like that that can very accurately see the depth of melanoma. We have very good correlation with histology. Um, and we see essentially individual cells, so we get a very good picture of how melanoma looks like. Um, we take some of these images and we make art from them. So we put them on the wall of Translatum as well. So this is in the third floor. These are art-made uh, high-frequency optoacoustic images of uh, the nail fold here. Um, and just as an example, this is work together with uh, Natalia Pelegata, where we're also applying this technology to uh, animal uh, research in order to, to, to see growth under different conditions and therapy effects. Um, and we have been investing also in bacteria, engineered bacteria, to use them either as sensors for cancer. These are bacteria that they will change, apparently we found, they change their color uh, when they are attacked by macrophages. So when we inject them into tumors, we can actually track macrophage activity using this engineered rhodobacter. We also use bacteria, we transfect them with the tyrosinase gene, uh, and then they produce these exosomes that they are packed with melanin. We use now these exosomes to track tumors, but also um, um, impart hyperthermia by cranking up a little bit the laser light that we emit. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip that last study and essentially would like to thank Marcus for the leadership uh, in all of this SFB in putting up Translatum, and overall, he's the reason I'm here in Munich. So for that, I'm very indebted. And um, thank you so much, Marcus, for everything. Uh, I think uh, words cannot capture sort of like uh, all, everything that uh, I want to say now. So it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, a very good thing in my life that I met Marcus. Let, let me put it this way. And uh, Wolfgang, we need to think about the next SFB. Uh, we should not let this great community just go by like this. I think we need to apply. We need to continue this work. So I hope we can manage to get that off the ground soon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Vasilis, for this uh, excellent lecture showing how optical imaging evolved from when we first met from those diffused blur images to something which looks like anatomy. Probably not anatomy, but close to it. A again, in the sake of time, we probably have time to discuss one short question. Is there a question from, from the audience? Well, probably I, I may ask one. You showed this example where you looked at tumor oxygenation hypoxia and said that the results are not quite uh, clear at this stage. What I actually learned or know is that hypoxia is a highly dynamic effect. Mm -hmm. So what is the temporal resolution actually of your methods and probably is this kind of unclear answer due to the dynamics? 
So we don't really do dynamic imaging. The technique is very fast. I mean, we can take a multispectral image in half a second. So each of these frames with all of the wavelengths, it's only less than a second, let's say. But we're not sitting there doing some perturbation. We're just using it like ultrasound, and we collect also the optoacoustic images. Some tumors are hypoxic. Some are not. And therefore, we cannot use this. We can use it as subcategorization, so maybe as a predictor for therapy. But in our hands, so far, it, it did not show to have diagnostic value. Agiogenesis seems to be a more consistent signal in that vascular bed in the clinical mm -hmm. uh, cancers, but not the hypoxia signal. We were, we were th thinking that we were always find a tumor that is hypoxic in the center. This is not what we're seeing right now. Well, well, yeah. OK, thank you. So we move on to the next speaker and to the next technology, which is MRI. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Franz Schilling from TUM. He actually, he actually is a physicist by training. Did his studies in Würzburg and, and uh, in, with, uh, with oh, uh, I'm blanking now, Alex Axel, Pines at Axel Berkeley. At Berkeley yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alex Pines at Berkeley, then came back to, came to Munich to do his PhD, and then went to Cambridge to, I think, Kevin Brindle to learn about hyperpolarization techniques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, he also got an award, which I, I, I was pleased to read. It was the Richard Ernst Award by the German uh, Chemical Society. Uh, Richard Ernst one, was one of my mentors, so therefore I was pleased to read that. And unfortunately, as you probably have known, he passed away about three weeks ago. So, uh, nevertheless, uh, the talk is about uh, MR methods, MRI methods, measuring tumor pH and tumor metabolism using hyperpolarized substrates. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Markus Rudin. And yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to, to speak to you. Of course, I have the challenge to speak after those excellent speakers, Simon Cherry and Vasilis, and before the coffee break. But I take the challenge, and I'm really happy that I can stand here in real again and see real f uh, and familiar faces. So our project joined the SFB uh, four years ago with a major focus on establishing a novel uh, method uh, based on pH imaging. And um, as a motivation why we chose pH as a target, you might know that uh, pH uh, basically affects several pathologies uh, that perturb the extracellular pH. For example, ischemia, inflammation, and tumors. And especially in tumors, enhanced glycolysis, hypoxia, and a low perfusion lead to a tumor acidification, which, as we think and as we hypothesize, can be used as a predictor for progression, invasion, and therapy. Unfortunately, currently in the clinic, there is no non-invasive whole body uh, pH imaging technique yet. And we have the aim to develop and establish such a technique that would then allow us uh, to phenotype tumors, to characterize tumor heterogeneity, and to monitor uh, tumor therapy and evaluate it. To, out to give you an outline of my talk, I'll first cover uh, the methods development that we've done over the past four or five years on hyperpolarized MRI pH sensor. I will then particularly focus on novel contrasts that we can actually image and quantify uh, with this method, mainly intratumoral pH heterogeneity. And in the end, I'd like then to show how this new method got integrated within the SFB. And I think this was also a ma major aim, also stated here with the title of the SFB. Uh, to select, monitor, and individualize therapy. And we really benefited from this uh, interdisciplinary work uh, within the SFB, also involving uh, multimodality imaging techniques. So around four years ago, we discovered this molecular structure, which is shown here. I think the laser pointer probably doesn't work anymore, so I'll just point at it, or uh, describe you the structure and its function. This is zymonic acid. It's a derivative, uh, derivative of pyruvate that we discovered. And it has one very interesting feature. It had an, has an acid dissociation constant in the physiological pH range at pH 6.9. Maybe the batteries, thank you. <laughs> and because of that, the protons at this pH value change and lead to uh, rapid changes in the protonation state uh, at the molecular site. This, in effect, affects the carbon-13 resonances of these two carbon-13 atoms that you see there, which we can detect by a magnetic resonance spectroscopy. 
So here are some uh, spectra of this molecule um, in a solution that is titrated to different pH values. And what you can observe and appreciate is that these two zymonic acid peaks, ZA5 and ZA1, they shift in frequency with the pH with respect to a non-shifting uh, compound, which is urea. So this is the principle of using MR and MR spectroscopy as the underlying technique to detect pH. Of course, because we can pick up the frequencies, it's a quantitative technique just by the measurement of the frequencies itself. We use another additional trick, and I won't go into the, the details of it, which is hyperpolarization, which is a method that, that allows you to, to magnetize your nuclear spins. In thermal equilibrium, your magnetic spins are pointing in arbitrary direction, leading to the effect that only a small portion actually contributes to the MR signal. By doing hyperpolarization, which we do by dynamic nuclear polarization, meaning we cool our sample to one Kelvin, irradiate it with microwaves, and then heat it up and then obtain an injectable solution, we can enhance the signal by 10,000 to 100,000 fold with the effect that if you would um, obtain or collect an MR spectrum on the left with conventional method, it would take one, uh, it would take three years. Whereas if you hyperpolarize your nuclei, it would actually just take one second. One second. So it's a, a huge sensitivity gain. So we've established this method by um, basically acquiring, uh, as you see here in the, in the picture on the bottom left, uh, chemical shift uh, resolved MR images that allows you to detect the frequency of the sensor molecule in each voxel. If you then titrate these plastic tubes that we here put as test samples, you get a colorful and um, quantitative pH image where you can then assign the individual pH values to the uh, corresponding MR tubes. We've done that as well in blood phantoms uh, at concentrations of 5 millimolar for urea, which we use as the chemical shift reference compound and also 5 millimolar of simonic acid, and compared those measurements in blood and phantoms and saw that uh, the sensor is also quite robust to external influences, such as different temperatures, different calcium concentrations, and uh, the presence of uh, deoxyhemoglobin in blood. Then using this, this hyperpolarized agent um, that we have injected as a test measurement in healthy kidney, kidneys, you can appreciate here, uh, that we can um, image and visualize uh, the perfusion of this agent uh, and as well as uh, urea in the kidney. And then we can calculate from the individual voxels based on the spectral analysis the average uh, pH values. Now, now nicely showing the distribution of the pH in the blood compartment indicated in red at physiological pH 7.4 and then um, a pH gradient throughout the kidney um, from, um, to, towards more acidic from the cortex to the medulla and to the ureter. One interesting feature in the spectra is that within one imaging voxel, you can obtain all these um, individual pH values. And I'll just point to that right here. So these uh, three colored uh, red, green and blue compartments correspond to three different pH compartments within one voxel in the kidney, resembling the individual uh, microstructure of the cortex, the medulla, and the ureter at different uh, pH values. This is really a unique uh, feature of this uh, technique based on the, the frequency-based MR detection that no other uh, technique that basically works just by distribution of an agent could provide. We further enhance the sensitivity of this method by deuterating the molecule. Um, this has an effect that relaxation effects are, are weakened, and this leads to longer relaxation times, meaning that our hyperpolarized state decays slower, leading to a signal enhancement. And you see here in the images that if we look at this uh, accumulation in the tumor and the pH map, we have enhanced civet sensitivity in the deuterated images compared to the under deuterated ones. And this can also then, for example, be used for uh, long time course experiments over more than a minute, where in this case on a clinical uh, scanner as a demonstration experiment, we've thrown a vitamin C tablet into a glass of water and then followed the, dis followed the distribution of the pH changes over time. Also, we've characterized um, the sensor simonic acid in terms of, of its relaxation properties and saw that also T1 relaxation, the longitudinal relaxation, is quite dependent on pH. And especially at the PKA values of zymonic acid, we saw drops in the relaxation times, which uh, leads to a slower um, 
decay of the signal, and this allowed us to optimize the signal preparation steps. We've also investigated transverse relaxation, T2. Um, potentially, this could also be used as a pH imaging method. However, we saw that this technique in comparison to the frequency-based detection is rather inaccurate, so we didn't follow up on this further for in vivo application and rather focused on the uh, frequency-based detection. Now recently, we've also come up with yet another novel pH sensor, and we've just recently, uh, six months ago, synthesized this structure, which is very analogous to zymonic acid. Its pKa is a little bit lower uh, than the one of zymonic acid, but still in the interesting physiological uh, pH range. Its resonances, again, as you see here, and can appreciate shift, this time also in opposite frequency direction, which gives you a higher dynamic range. But the most interesting feature uh, we think right now is that it has an extremely long relaxation time, T1, which is, of course, beneficial uh, for hypopolarized experiments. We have at one Tesla in blood more than a minute and uh, in D2O even uh, more than two minutes T1. And this is one of the highest carbon-13 T1s uh, for uh, uh, molecules that are relevant in vivo observed so far. And we also uh, obtain good polarization level. So at the end of the SFP period, uh, quite a new uh, discovery that will probably lead to a further in vivo applications and we are quite exciting to do the first in vivo experiments in two weeks. Nevertheless, with zymonic acid, we've um, established the methods also in, in mice, in a mouse model, after performing the first experiments in rats, which was a bit challenging because of the smaller size. But we could again validate that in the kidneys we could obtain these three different compartments, uh, again labeled in red, blue, and green here uh, on the left image uh, of the cortex, the medulla, and the ureter. And these three compartments are visible and also uh, comparable in between these different uh, wild-type animals. As you can appreciate, the analysis of this uh, spectrum of these features is quite complex. So we actually put up a collaboration also with Bjorn Mense to see whether artificial intelligence and deep learning can help us and can improve uh, detection of these complex spectra. And we've just uh, yesterday uh, submitted a, a report to the EGNMI journal um, reporting that we can actually get more accurate uh, with regard to um, human-based analysis and, and also show uh, enhancements regarding the uh, spectral analysis of these complex spectra. So now this is um, an imaging study with an IL-4 lymphoma mouse model. And I think this quite nicely demonstrates um, the new advantages of, these, of this technique. So here you, see the, here you see the average pH map, the tumor is encircled in white, and now we focus on one specific subregion that is also encircled in yellow that is a bit more acidic than the rest. So if you take a close look at the spectrum, we see again this um, compartmentation into three different uh, pH values uh, corresponding to the different NMR frequencies. And now this allows us across the entire uh, pH map to actually decompose the pH into different compartments. So we see that basically the entire uh, tumor and also this slice within the animal contains a physiologic pH compartment at pH 7.4. Then there is an acidic compartment. And in addition, there's a very strongly acidic compartment just in some regions of the tumor. We found that highly interesting as it might correspond to um, different uh, molecular substructure of the tumor and potentially to uh, more aggressive uh, tumor cells within this tumor, potentially giving us a new method to characterize those regions. We have uh, looked at this in quite a large group of animals, 11, and nine of them actually showed these strongly acidic compartments, so this really seems to be a feature uh, of this tumor model that can also be uh, reproduced. Now I want to switch um, to projects uh, where we've uh, um, established this pH imaging method uh, within the SFB. And the first one is a, a metabolic characterization of patient-derived glioblastoma in mice that are also treated with um, uh, mesenchymal stem cells uh, that uh, hypoxia-based express uh, the sodium iodide supporter. So this is together with uh, Professor Glass from Project B2 and also uh, Christine Spitzweg from Project uh, C8. What we aimed here for is to look at energy metabolism. So by looking at uh, the endpoints of glycolysis using a hypopolarized agent, pyruvate that is injected and that shows us the conversion to lactate after it's being taken up in the, in the cell. 
as well as acidification uh, measured by our hyperpolarized pH sensor and hypoxia uh, measured by f -Mysopet. These metabolic imaging features can then also be later, of course, correlated with uh, the sodium iodide uptake measured by PET, um, which is an interesting correlation because we can investigate whether the metabolic uh, parameters that we measure in the beginning, in the advance, would then correlate with the diagnostic information that also predicts the, the therapy of an iodide therapy. So the, the study's design was like this, that uh, first um, the um, multimodal imaging happened um, in a time frame where hypopolarized MRSI with zymonic acid and pyruvate was done. Three days later, we injected f -miso. then the mesenchymal stem cells were injected, and after that, 48 hours after that, the sodium iodide PET was done. In addition to that, we also did classical proton-based uh, diffusion-weighted MRI and, of course, anatomical MRI and uh, histology in the end. So this gives us the chance now to characterize the metabolism from different viewpoints um, regarding pH, um, pyruvate to lactate conversion, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging characterizing the cell density, as well as hypoxia. What we found when we look at these different imaging biomarkers, and here you now see a, a summary of it, is that um, out of these two different uh, subtypes of glioblastoma, which are named GBM2 and GBM14 here, we actually can separate by the acidification and the F-miso uptake, the subtype of this glioblastoma tumor model, then potentially predicting how much uh, sodium iodide would actually be taken up and how successful the therapy uh, would be. These experiments will actually be presented later by Christine Spitzweg, but um, we see actually quite some nice correlations here with the metabolic parameters that we could image by our combined uh, PET-MRI approach. A second uh, project together with uh, project C10, Angela Krakart and Carlo Gero d'Alessandria, is to correlate the influence of pH, tumor pH, on T cell therapies. There's quite a lot of literature already around that uh, basically confirms that in a very acidic regions, T cell activation is actually diminished. And we would uh, now have the aim here to characterize that by our pH imaging method. Um, pH, and in addition, can be measured again with zymonic acid in our hypopolarized pH sensor, whereas we can image um, the T cell distribution by immunopet, as we've heard earlier by um, Mr. Fries. Uh, in this case, a zirconium uh, labeled antibody is being used. The timeline of the experiment, again, is that uh, we will um, do a T cell injection at day eight, and then three days later uh, introduce the zirconium agent, and after that, for three days in a row, over a time course of three days, we would do PET and MRI imaging. I'll just point out first the pH maps in this ML2 uh, leukemia uh, model in mice here. Uh, the tumor is encircled in the white region of interest again. And what was interesting in this model with regard to pH is that the tumor was basically, or could be split in two regions. One of the regions was very physiologic with regard to the pH, and the other one was very acidic. Now, interestingly, once we've done um, the zirconium PET, and now you see the corresponding time points just above each other, you can directly appreciate that a low pH corresponds to almost no zirconium uptake over the entire time points, and also that over the entire course of the therapy, as you see in the top row, pH um, slowly increases again. So we might actually observe here first the effects of the therapy, and second also we might actually predict where the zirconium is taken up, where the T cells were actually homing. So we are still doing um, experiments here, but in the first group of three animals that were measured at three time points, we see a correlation of zirconium uptake versus pH over time. And this correlation gets actually even stronger if we use not the absolute pH value as a biomarker, but um, the acidification, which is the difference of the pH compared to a, a relative standard, which is the pH in the muscle in this case. Then the correlation, as you can appreciate in the right uh, image, uh, is even stronger, and we see that a higher acidification leads to lower uh, zirconium uptake. As a last um, project, I was want to briefly introduce a project where we characterize um, metabolic heterogeneity in feline fibrosarcoma. So this was a project initiated by Professor Schweiger uh, three years ago, and the aim was to show the translational potential of this uh, hypopolarization method on a clinical scanner. 
Again, we were measuring LDH activity, acidification, and hypoxia. And you can appreciate here in one of the patients that actually in this fibrosarcoma, there is heterogeneity to be observed in terms of the pyruvate lactate conversion, but as well in the pH maps and the f -mizopet. So these features can be characterized and potentially then be used for radiation planning therapy. So to summarize um, this project, I think first I could show you that uh, we've developed several hypopolarized MIH pH sensors, namely zymonic acid and z -OMPD, which have the, I think, main characteristic feature that they are frequency-based, allowing to separate um, individual pH compartments. And we've seen that this can be used to characterize subvoxel pH heterogeneity. Then we've also applied this pH imaging method, and uh, as an example, just three examples were shown here for selection, monitoring, and individualization of the therapy. I'd really like to thank all of the persons involved. Really want to point out uh, Martin Grashammer and Christian Hunsammer, who uh, did most of the work, and of course also the support from uh, Professor Schweiger and Professor Weber just within the department, and our collaboration partners uh, within the SFB. It was a real pleasure to work with you uh, within this wonderful SFB. I think uh, together and with all our expertise and knowledge, we are really much, much more than just the sum of our parts. And um, yeah, I really want to thank these two persons, mainly Professor Schweiger, for all the leadership and all the yeah, mentorship that he did during this period, especially also to young scientists like me and uh, Thorsten Gerken, uh, who really did a wonderful job in holding us all together. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes. So thank you very much for this uh, very interesting lecture, showing that MR is much more than just anatomy, that it can get deep in inside into metabolism, into function whatsoever. Uh, if I consult my watch, we are in the middle of the coffee break, so I would suggest that we postpone any questions with the coffee break. And I got the permit by the organizer to prolong the coffee break by five minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> we reconvene at uh, 11.35. Thank you. OK, so welcome back after, after the coffee break. Uh, we now switch gears in a way that uh, we don't have the inventors speak about their technologies, which is clear that they are excited about it. Now we come to the clinicians who value the technologies and use the technologies in their work. And the first speaker after the break is Benedict Wiesler. He's actually uh, heading the group of computational imaging at the Neuroradiology Center here at TUM. He's an MD by training, did his studies in Bonn and Heidelberg, then moved to Munich to the Klinikum Rechts der Isar. And actually, what I read, actually, he collaborated a lot with Björn Menze. Yeah. And Björn Menze is now in Zurich, very clear, almost next to my office. So we collaborated also quite a bit, and uh, so the world is really a small world, as, as you can see. Uh, the title of his talk will be Intratumoral Heterogeneity in Gliomas, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Professor Schweiger, um, thank you again very much for um, inviting me first to this third funding period and now um, today again in person um, for this talk. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, this project uh, I did together with uh, Björn Menze, who was back then still at the Department of Informatics and now um, is uh, in Zurich. Uh, They're in the Department of Quantitative Biomedicine and it is about um, assessing glioma imaging basically across space and time. So what do I mean by that? Um, what motivated us is something that you, we now know is true for a lot of tumors, but for glioblastoma multiforme, we already knew it by the old name. The multiforme was erased in 2016 by the WHO, but it wasn't called multiforme for a reason, right? Um, so we know that these tumors are very heterogeneous. This is a work from 2013, for example, showcasing this, where we see that um, even within a single tumor uh, from a single patient, multiple subclones exist and coexist that share some genomic aberrations, but also each have unique genomic aberrations. And um, this also is true for targetable alterations. So for example, EGF receptor is something that uh, comes to mind very often. Um, it has excessively been tested in glioblastoma, amongst other diseases, in phase two and three trials, and basically failed in all trials in glioblastoma, as is probably true for all sorts of target therapies in this disease. 
And we now know that heterogeneity is most probably one of the root or the root cause um, for this. And on the other hand, we acquire very rich imaging protocols, um, not only within this SFB, but partly, of course, driven by this SFB. And this is um, from a work um, that we did together with the nuclear medicine department, um, with neurosurgery and neuropathology, and published last year in the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine, um, on the use of such a um, really rich imaging protocol featuring, for example, perfusion imaging to assess angiogenesis, featuring FETPET, APT-weighted imaging, which is a novel contrast developed um, by Philips, similar to CEST, um, or diffuse and tensor imaging, which we heard a little bit about before, um, to characterize distinct um, angiogenic and, and oncogenic sorry, properties of the tumor, such as angiogenesis, cellular density, tumor microarchitecture. And what drove our project and still drives our project is the question, how can we intelligently use this information, which today is not really used in clinical practice, the Rano criteria, for example, which we use today, um, still only look at contrast enhancement in a very, very rough two-axis perpendicular measurement. Um, but how can we use this very rich information clinically to learn about heterogeneity and tumor growth? Um, and one of the first things that we had to do, basically, um, to tackle this problem is develop a toolbox. And this is what Florian Kofler, who is a PhD student funded uh, within this SFB, did. Um, we, um, and in particular Björn, is um, implicated in the BRAS challenge, the Brain Tumor Segmentation Challenge, and as such we collected a lot of state-of-the-art segmentation algorithms, so algorithms that detect and subclassify a tumor into, for example, contrast-enhancing part necrosis or edema, um, automatically on images without um, human interference, so without the need for manual annotation of tumors. And he brought this into a, in a unifying pipeline, basically, that handles all steps necessary for processing and segmenting these images on a cascade, so on an ensemble um, of different algorithms. And why is this ensembling, why does this make sense? This is an example from the paper where we see here three different single candidate segmentation algorithms, all of which were ranked in the top 10 of the batch challenge, so it can be considered state-of-the-art algorithms. But each algorithm makes, makes, some, makes some mistakes circled in white. And um, if you do it, for example, iterative simple fusions or other sort of fusion algorithms, so we, we um, researched a little bit in this direction, then you can end up with very stable, um, very trustworthy segmentations. Also, importantly, longitudinally. So across time, we get very reliable estimates of tumor growth and tumor burden, which to us was obviously the basis for subsequent analysis. This pipeline is now used in collaboration also, for example, um, with uh, Zurich, with uh, Michael Mich with Pasavella in the neuro oncology department there, with Tübingen or with Frankfurt, um, and is publicly available. So regarding space, so the first axis that um, we talked about, um, we were, of course, interested in deciphering heterogeneity. So what we did in, in the first step together with the neuropathology department, with Frederik Lische Starnecker, um, is we looked at immunohistochemistry and clustered immunohistochemical data um, from a single patient. And what we saw um, is that, of course, also with immunohistochemistry, we observe heterogeneity in these tumors. We observe clusters that we can find, for example, also again with respect to EGFR. Um, and this is shown in this example in a bit more detail. So even in a specimen from a single patient, we find areas that are really also morphologically distinct um, that can stably be clustered in the different subclasses of tumors within a single patient. To go deeper, and this was basically the backbone study of, um, of our SFB project, and we, we, had we had some COVID delays, like probably everybody, but we finished it a couple of weeks ago. So we included 50 patients in a prospective trial where we took stereotactically targeted biopsies from these patients. So we took um, several roughly 4 by 4 by 4 millimeter large biopsy patches um, stereotactically targeted. So we exactly know where each biopsy point comes from um, in the tumor. So we can map this back basically to an extensive preoperative imaging protocol that we acquired. And what you can see here already in the H and E stains um, from these biopsy samples is that these tumors look very heterogeneous already, right? So Already just looking at it, the H and E stains gives you a sense of the heterogeneity we see. Um, we started working up um, the methylation data. So within the SFB, we had the opportunity to do genome and epigenome-wide deep uh, sequencing of these tumors. And what we see here in this slide, and this is just some preliminary first results because we just finished recruitment for this study, um, is that along these 50 patients um, on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the number of samples that um, we 
observe heterogeneity also in the methylation subclasses. So each color encodes for a specific methylation subclass, and you can see that over half of patients has different methylation subclasses. So these were thought to be global labels for a single tumor, but indeed they are also very heterogeneous. So we find multiple subclasses within a single patient. This can be traced down even further, so we have the methodology to go down even further onto single aberrations, and this now is uh, MGMT, which for us is an important predictive marker. It tells us if a tumor is susceptible to timozolomide, which is our backbone chemotherapy for these patients. And it was thought that it's either methylated or non-methylated in the patient. Methylated is good because it means that timozolomide works better. Um, unmethylated is bad, but what we see is that it's not the case, that even MGMT um, can be unmethylated, can be homogeneously unmethylated or methylated, but there are also patients where we observe heterogeneity even down to single targets um, that we can trace. We also can trace lineage in these cells, so we can add now, we can start to add the temporal dimension um, to the space dimension that I started talking about. So um, by analyzing copy number profiles, we can retrace the development of these tumors because um, we just can assume that the, the tumor subclone that has the most balanced copy number profile is most close to the normal tissue it arose from. And then during tumor evolution, um, either gains or losses of specific copy numbers or pro genes can be found and we can trace this back. And we are currently in the process of mapping all these information, so lineage information um, and uh, genome information back to the MR images to develop basically models that non-invasively map these genotypes to the MR image. Um, and that is, that is ongoing. But what we in parallel also investigated is the longitudinal axis, so time, development across time, um, because this is something um, that, of course, also is, is of high interest. This is a busy slide. Don't worry, I'll, I'll walk you through the most important parts. This is work done by Jana Lipkova, who was a PhD student in our department, is now doing her postdoc in Boston. Um, and this is about growth modeling. So this is the quintessential um, fischer kolmogorov reaction diffusion growth model, um, which is um, a PDE, so it's hard for us to solve computationally. Um, and she found a way to solve it with, um, with an inverse solution. Um, and then using multiple simulations and Bayesian modeling, we can basically, um, from a single time point image, so this is just one preoperative image, so we don't need multiple longitudinal images, which are used as of to now to infer development of tumors. We use a single time point and simulations to figure out the patient-specific individual best matching um, parameters to this growth model. And this is informed by um, anatomy, so by um, standard anatomical images, and by FATPAT. So we require FATPAT basically as input, um, giving us information about cellular density, the tumor cell density. And then we can basically derive, um, derive tumor growth from this. And this is one example. So this is the preoperative image. This is overlaid the tumor cell density plots, and you can see that these growth models inherently already recapitulate phenotypes that we also observe um, in vivo. So for example, we see the spread across the corpus callosum, which is very typical for glioblastoma, which is the natural way to grow along fiber tracts, and the corpus callosum is the most directed fiber tract we have in the brain. Um, and what you can also see, and this was done in close collaboration with the radiation oncology department, um, you can use these maps actually for radiotherapy planning. This, of course, was just retrospectively looking at these maps, so this is not a prospective trial, um, but we can use these maps to um, individualize or personalize treatment. One problem with this method, and this is something that we also looked into, is I, I told you before, um, this, uh, these um, partial differential equations are hard to solve. They're actually very hard to solve. So. Um, using these forward simulations that I just showed you on the LRZ, so Leibniz Rechenzentrum cluster, takes a couple of weeks for a single patient. So this is not feasible in clinical practice, right? If I tell my patient, you can come back in four weeks and then we've calculated your growth model. Um, so what we did, or what Ivan Etzov did, who's a PhD student in our department, is um, we used um, we used a deep neural network basically as a PDE solver. So this has been done in some other disciplines before. It has not been done for this particular problem. And in particular, it has not been done um, with um, anatomical constraints in mind. So we have anatomical constraints. Tumors, for example, cannot grow into the CSF. So this constrains the set of solutions that we need to look at and can help us to more effectively search solutions. And so what we do is we have the individual anatomy from the patient. We encode this in the first encoder part of the network. Then we map or we mix or concatenate this latent space representation of the individual anatomy with um, parameters for this growth model. So these are parameters that describe this growth model. And then we just ask the tumor, to be, uh, the network, sorry, not the tumor. <laughs> we ask the network to basically reconstruct 
um, the prediction, so the output prediction of our growth model. Um, and this speeds up these calculations by a factor of roughly 100. So this becomes feasible now also for clinical routine to solve these, uh, to solve these part, uh, partial differentials um, within a clinically reasonable time frame and make use of this. And in parallel, um, uh, and in parallel, we are very much interested uh, in diffusion tensor imaging. Um, this is a technique that um, has briefly been touched upon um, as diffusion imaging. If you if you add more um, diffusion gradients, then you can actually measure the diffusivity. So you can measure, for example, tracts in the brain. Um, and this is a technique that has shown promise to predict um, tumor infiltration in the brain. However, it is plagued by one thing, and it is plagued by the fact that as a diffusion uh, as a diffusion method, it gets um, it gets noisy in the peritumal edema. So where there is free water in the edema, um, the diffusion signal gets noisy or gets all corrupted by the isotropic diffusion noise. Um, and on the other hand, the peritumal edema is where 90 plus percent of recurrences occur. So this is the region that interests us the most. So um, Miguel Molina Romero, who also was a PhD student, developed um, a deep neural network to disentangle the diffusion signal that we measure into two compartments the isotropic diffusion coming from free water, so the diffusion we actually don't care about so much because this is just edema, and the anisotropic diffusion that we actually care about. Um, and via this method, we can basically recover a so-called free water estimated or free water corrected diffusion signal. And um, we investigated whether this diffusion signal helps us to um, better find where occurrences occur. And this uh, is work done by Marie Metz, who's, who was an MD student in our group and has now started um, her residency in the neuroradiology department. Um, we had a cohort of 45 glioblastoma patients. We could automatically assess them with the tooling I just showed you. So we can, we can also automatically map back the recurrence locations because we can segment the entire tumor all the time. So there's virtually no manual annotations required and it becomes rather objective. And what we see is that if you compare the standard fractional isotropy, so this is one parameter map we calculate from diffusion tensor imaging, and it's supposed to show us um, infiltration of tumor cells into the peritumal edema, um, then what you see is that the discrepancy between areas where there is just edema, so recurrence-free edema here in green, and areas where later recurrence occurs on the preoperative scan becomes only very um, pronounced if you look at the very high percentiles. So you have to really look in the extremes of your distribution. However, if you use free water um, correction, then you can see that the difference between the green and the, um, and the blue um, bar, so voxels that later will show recurrence and voxels that will not show recurrence later, um, becomes much more pronounced basically across the entire distribution of voxels, which is just what we expected because we increase the statistical power of our method by removing the isotropic diffusion noise. Um, and this, again, also, of course, we just tested this um, with the radiation therapy group um, from Professor Combs, can be used to plan radiotherapy. And, of course, this is a natural now, and this is one of the next steps we do, um, to use this information to further personalize the growth model that I just showed you. So we have now a cohort of roughly 200 patients, or 150 patients, with fat pad and diffusion tensor imaging preoperatively and recurrence, um, and we're currently working on ways to basically combine um, these two information together. So um, we want to merge these approaches. We want to also merge the space and time axis that are now presented a little bit separately. So um, what we want to do is, of course, we want to follow tumor heterogeneity over time. We are starting a project with uh, Michael Vella in Zürich now, who's doing um, immunotherapy for these patients. And we basically want to follow up the uh, evolution and development of tumors during immunotherapy and maybe if there's, for example, subclone development and there's, there's, if there becomes dominance of single subclones. Um, we also want to use this heterogeneity mapping for growth modeling. As of now, we use a global growth model for a single patient. This is probably not adequate, but due to the fact that otherwise it becomes completely not bearable for us to do at the moment, but we're working on ways to include this. We're about to further validate these findings together with colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania. We filed for a joint uh, R01 grant um, to build up a consortium where we will gather data um, on tumor growth and development and recurrence. And we're extending this to medulloblastoma, where a tumor radiology will be the imaging and radiomics core for this worldwide phase two trial um, in the personalized treatment of medulloblastoma patients. And funded by Krebshilfe, we'll have a competitive translational research program paralleling the clinical trial. 
um, with that. Thank you very much. Um, again, in particular to the SFB, which for me was vital when I came to Munich in 2015 and then had the opportunity to join the SFB to basically kickstart a lot of the stuff that um, I did. This was very helpful to me, so thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the people um, involved within and outside of the SFB. Um, I found this to be a very collaborative environment here in Munich, and I'm, I'm very happy that um, I had the chance to do this here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wiesler, for this impressive talk, actually. I was impressed by an MT speaking so deeply about uh, data processing, informatics, MR, basics, which probably shows that the SFB 824 was successful, that you merged the two groups, actually, and probably also the impact of the translatum, so. Yeah, yeah no, translatum <coughs> also wasn't yeah. is vital to us, no? Yeah. One question from the audience. I mean, uh, Markus Schweiger mentioned in the very beginning that we should see imaging as a multimodal approach. Yeah. Now, of course, your analysis system is mainly based on MRI these days. How open is your system to incorporate data from other disciplines? Um, very much. Um, and I think this is one of the <coughs> main, I, w I wouldn't say promises, but maybe, yeah, let's, let's say promises of, of deep learning in general. I mean, we're now starting projects with um, Jana Lipkova in Boston and here our neuropathology where we um, basically learn jointly on histology and imaging data. Um, and this could be PET data, this can be MR data. Um, so basically that the system learns to uh, work on data of different level, which up to now requires different specialties, right? So like in a tumor board, you have different specialties to come together. And with deep learning, we have the opportunity to basically combine the expertise of different specialties into, into models, really appreciating tumors at all scales of, um, of their complexity. Okay, so we move on to the next speakers, the last speakers in the first group which actually, again, reflect the approach of SFB A24 and Translatum because there are two speakers, an engineer and a biologist. Uh, probably just briefly some words, so I start with the engineer first and then come to you. So the engineer, uh, Dimitrios Karampinos, he's a M F MR physicist, engineer by training. He studied in Athens and then went to Urbana. I don't know whether he still met uh, Paul Lottebuhr, he was still alive then. So, one of the fathers of MRI, before he then came to Munich to build up the team here. And the second speaker is Marosio Berial Diaz from the Hel Helmholtz Center in Munich. He's the vice director of, of the Department for Metabolism and Cancer, as far as I know. He was trained as a biologist in Heidelberg. Or Roughly. Marburg, in Marburg, not Heidelberg, yeah, I remember. Marburg, but then went to Heidelberg before he came actually to, to Munich. And uh, the talk actually, not surprising, is about metabolism, tumor metabolism uh, in cancer cachexia. Thank you Please. very much, Marcus, for the kind introduction. And uh, right at the beginning, I would like to really thank Marcus Schweiger for, you know, um, inviting us to join this nice SFP in the third funding period, and uh, for this project dealing with imaging and molecular characterization of cancer cachexia, for which we teamed up with Dimitris Karampinos. So cancer cachexia, this term describes the involuntary weight loss associated with different cancer diseases, um, gastrointestinal cancers, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer is very prominent there, and uh, it's a multifactorial syndrome uh, which implies various uh, components. So in the presence of a cachexia-inducing tumor, there might be a variable degree of anorexia or also malabsorption, and this contributes to reduction in energy intake. But besides this, there is a deep dysregulation of systemic metabolism, which uh, affects many different organs, such as, for instance, the adipose tissue, wherein the cachexia condition lipolysis is induced and leads to the release of fatty acids and, and the wasting of, of the energy stores in the body in form of fat. In the muscle, which is traditionally the most uh, studied 
uh, tissue in, in cachexia, there is increased proteolysis and reduced protein synthesis overall, leading to strong muscle atrophy. And this is also true for the heart, so atrophy of the heart and also um, uh, dysfunctional uh, or, or um, uh, affects the heart function, which also can contribute to mortality in, as in association with cancer. In the liver, there is a strong acute phase response. Transiently, there is lipid accumulation. And overall, cachexia is strongly characterized by systemic inflammation uh, and, and the induction of, of various um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And all these together leads to this negative energy balance that then results in tissue waste, wasting and, and weight loss. And, and this is of clinical relevance because the cancer cachexia does not only affect the quality of life on, of the patients, but it's also associated with reduced tolerance and efficacy of the cancer therapy. And this is why it's not surprising that it's associated with poor prognosis. And it's estimated that around 20 to 30% of all cancer-related deaths are uh, attributable to the cachexia uh, uh, progression. And, and still, uh, besides this, this clinical relevance, there is still a lack of stratification for cachexia risk in cancer patients and also a lack of, of standardized therapies. Um, there has been a, a consensus publication on the clinical definition of cachexia, which is kind of 5% um, weight loss or 2% weight loss when the BMI is below 20 in, in six months. And, and, and this is then uh, considered a cachexic pa cancer patient. Um, however, it's, it, there is a strong kind of consensus that the intervention against cachexia needs to start early in order to prevent or, or, uh, the development of cachexia because it will be very difficult to then reverse uh, this phenotype once the patient started to lose weight. And this is particularly true for the end stage of the disease. So interventions, and this are envisioned to be multimodal interventions, including nutritional support, um, exercise, but also pharmacological interventions, uh, needs to start early. And this uh, um, illustrates the need for good biomarkers for prediction of cachexia and early diagnosis. Uh, and this is why one important aim of this project was to identify uh, biomarkers for cachexia diagnosis uh, monitoring and, and, and prediction, uh, and, and we do this on, on two sides, so using uh, preclinical models um, in order to identify molecular biomarkers, um, and as well as, as uh, then with imaging, and this is the part that Dimitris will report on. Um, so in order to identify factors that are involved in cachexia development, we took advantage of, of two tumor models, colon cancer models, uh, these two cell lines, MT38 and C26, that when implanted into mice subcutaneously develop similar tumors, at, at least in size, but they differ strongly in the cachexia developing property. So C26 uh, um, bearing mice will lose a lot of weight, while MT38 tumor bearing mice don't lose any weight. And, and we use these two cell lines for a differential secretome analysis in order to identify the secreted proteins and the differences in, in secreted proteins using mass spec. And, and when doing this, we focus then on, on the factors that are more strongly, more abundantly secreted by the cachexia inducing C26 uh, tumor, um, uh, uh, C26 cachexia inducing cell line. And one candidate that, that uh, um, was interesting for us was PLA2G7 uh, um, because we could see that th this uh, characteristic um, um, expression as well as, as uh, the activity in the supernatant of these cells uh, was not only true for the C26 cachexia inducing cell lines but also for other cachexia models or cachexia inducing cell lines like this lung cancer model, the Lewis lung carcinoma as well as the, this pancreatic cancer model. And um, also interesting for us was the enzymatic activity of PLA2G7. So it's a phospholysis base that cleaves phospholipids at the A2 position. And, and this was shown to, 
be potentially involved in, in, in the release of LPC, so lysophosphatidylcholine, or oxidized fatty acid that could be involved in oxidative stress, which is one of the processes that contribute particularly to muscle atrophy. So we were interested also in PLA2G7 as a potential target for therapy. However, uh, to cut a long story short, knockdown of PLA2G7 in the tumors, as well as, as the specific inhibition with daraplatib in, in, in the cachectic mice, did not ameliorate the cachectic phenotype. So it's obviously not a good target for cachexia. However, we saw that it's consistently higher, uh, uh, the, the activity of this enzyme is consistently higher also in mice, bearing the cachexia um, uh, tumor, inducing tumors. Here you see again the, the body weight phenotype in contrast to mice without cachexia. Uh, and this was also true for this lung cancer model, so this is now the corresponding in vivo data. And also in the course of the disease, you see that elevated levels can only also be seen uh, in pre mice where the body weight loss was not so pronounced. Uh, and here again, uh, some data were showing that at a time point where there was not clear body weight loss yet, we could already see the increase in PLA2G7, and this was also predicted for those mice that, uh, that uh, developed a strong cachexia earlier than, than others. So there was a strong correlation, and this is another way to depict this data. So PLA2G7 levels really correlated nicely with the degree of weight loss um, in the different models, and this was also true here for this genetic uh, cancer, um, pancreatic cancer model. So this is why we believe this can be an interesting biomarker for early uh, detection of, of patients at risk in cachexia, and, and this we could nicely confirm also um, in, in patient samples um, that we received also in collaboration with our uh, partners in the clinics, showing that cachectic pa uh, cancer patients had higher levels of PLH2-7 uh, in comparison to non-cachectic uh, cancer patients, and when we do a rock analysis, uh, we can show that PLA2G7 protein levels as well as activity um, is even um, uh, superior to, to discriminate be between cachectic and non-cachectic ca cancer patients than, than other factors that are used in the clinic like GDF15 or interleukin in 6. So th this is why we think it could be useful as a biomarker for cachexia detection, maybe in combination also with imaging biomarkers. And with this, I would like to pass the word to, to Dimitris, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, and welcome from my side as well. So on the clinical arm of the study, we have been developing and employing imaging biomarkers for monitoring weight loss and also hopefully predicting weight loss in cancer cachexia. Magnetic resonance imaging offers a plethora of potential biomarkers for tracking cachexia. Using water fat separation techniques, MRI can be used to assess skeletal muscle loss, which in our case we focus on the paraspinal muscles because of the ability to also include other important abdominal organs while performing such a scan. MRI then can be used to look at muscle volume and intramuscular fat. On the other side, MRI can be used to assess adipose tissue loss and adipose tissue composition changes by quantifying the subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue volume, but also looking at adipose tissue lipid composition changes. Lastly, Mauricio mentioned about the changes also that happen in other organs and the potential effect of uh, the wasting syndrome on, on the liver and potentially the pancreas. And you can actually use MRI to assess ectopic fat deposition in the pancreas and the liver. To do that, we are performing a water fat separation technique, which relies on a dedicated imaging pulse sequence on the MR side, typically uh, performed in a breath hold. We have to employ uh, specialized image reconstruction techniques in order to perform uh, an analysis that enables us to derive a quantitative imaging biomarker, the proton density fat fraction. Therefore, we have to correct for all these different confounding factors. With the final goal to get volumetric images that show us the water information, the fat information, and on the bottom here, a proton density fat fraction map. Such a map is a standardized map where we can actually assess um, a tissue fat concentration. The state-of-the-art fat quantification methodology gives you images for the fat image like this. 
So it's a low resolution technique and it's typically performed using breath hold acquisitions. However, when we move to uh, cancer patients, many times we want to increase the spatial resolution, especially when the fat depots become uh, smaller in volume, so we need to go to higher resolution. And ideally, we want to remove the need for performing breath holds. Part of this uh, um, uh, project, we have been developing new techniques in order to essentially enable moving from the low resolution image on the top to a free breathing high resolution image on the bottom. To do that, we're using dedicated imaging pulse sequences, which enables to uh, basically oversample the low resolution of the image using what's called a dedicated case space trajectory on the core of the MR uh, technical part. However, by doing that, we introduce a lot of problems into our imaging quantification aspects. This is because our gradient hardware is not perfect, and therefore we are, have been developing techniques in order to characterize our imperfections. Here is an example showing you proton density fat fraction maps with high resolution. Before any correction and after the correction, before the correction you get uh, PDFA values that can be negative, which of course are not meaningful, and using the correction you're able to retain the quantitative fidelity of the fat fraction compared to a, uh, a breath hold acquisition. We have been uh, using both the breath hold and the high resolution imaging uh, acquisitions in a clinical study. Uh, th that was a study on 58 patients with newly diagnosed cancer with different tumor entities, where we perform MRI of the abdomen and the pelvis, resulting in total in 89 study scans, including 32 longitudinal scans in 22 patients. So some, many patients were scanned uh, many times, and I, ideally the goal was to uh, be scanned as, as many times as possible during the clinical walkout. We determined anthropometric measurements, including body weight, height, uh, waist circumference, tithers, tithers, tithers circumference, and then we, we performed our imaging experiment with the final goal to extract the paraspinal muscle volume, the contractile tissue volume, and the fat volume. Think of the contractile tissue volume as a metric of how use much useful uh, muscle is left after these changes, and also the fat content, the uh, muscle PDFF. We have been also using such a methodology to assess adipose tissue changes in terms of subcutaneous and visceral fat volume changes and changes in the lipid content in the adipose tissue. Here is some of our results about the longitudinal uh, muscle changes. You can see here at the baseline of one of our oncological patients and then after um, uh, almost, I think, uh, 300 days here, you see the atrophy in the, um, in the paraspinal muscles, in the psoas and the rectospinae muscles. What we were able to show, however, for both the psoas and the rectospinal muscles, that we, uh, the rectospinal muscles, we didn't see any changes in the fat content. So in other words, the fat content in the two muscles stays relatively um, stable, and this was the case for both a whole muscle analysis or an analysis of the different musculature, uh, muscular regions uh, by defining uh, three different regions, proximal, middle, and distal. When we now look at the, uh, uh, at the muscle volume, the contractile tissue volume, and the fat volume, we saw a decrease for all three parameters with uh, um, um, basically over, uh, over the longitudinal axis, of the time axis, and we're able to uh, show that uh, such an effect both for the psoas and the rectospinae muscles. And also quite interesting, we're able to see that on the distal locations for the rectospinae muscles are the most affected ones. Similar patterns exist in similar scenarios in muscle physiology where fat infiltration starts on the distal side for instance, in the, in the context of neuromuscular diseases. The most exciting result from our analysis of the clinical study was trying to use the baseline measurements to predict weight uh, loss during the progression of the disease in these patients. So here is a, a, a plot showing on the uh, vertical axis the BMI change on the horizontal axis, the fat volume of the, um, of the psoas musculature at baseline. And what we're able to see is that subjects that tend to have more fat volume at baseline, the psoas musculature, and also higher fat content, this I'm not showing here, they tend to lose more weight. And this is the case here, for instance, of these subjects where in the second case on, uh, on uh, subject B, we have a 4% uh, change in the BMI. We have been also looking at longitudinal adipose tissue changes. This analysis is not complete yet. Some of our preliminary results, so of course, the impressive change that we see uh, from a baseline here to a follow-up on a change of the subcutaneous and visceral fat volume, but we also see changes in the composition on the adipose tissue. And these changes in the, for instance, in the VAT uh, proton density fat fraction, like the lower values you get uh, for the change on the VAT PDFF, the lower uh, BMI change you have. And we are trying also to perform, uh, to complete the analysis and fully characterize also uh, the potential um, risk prediction effect of such results. To summarize, 
So for both the preclinical part and the clinical part, Mauricio showed that circulating PLA 2G7 activity is induced in different mouse models of cancer, cachexia, and it correlates with the degree of weight loss. Such uh, levels can be increased also in cachectic cancer patients. I think it was quite exciting to see that from the clinical study. And such protein levels could distinguish between cachectic and non-cachectic patients, suggesting a potential biomarker function. On the clinical imaging part side, we have been developing uh, high resolution techniques using non-Cartesian imaging to enable high resolution uh, uh, fat analysis in these patients. We have been characterizing the paraspinal muscle, contractile tissue, and fat volume, and so decreases in the cancer cachectia induced weight loss and regional variations which can be uh, further explored and potentially defined later specific sites and regions to uh, develop um, um, uh, further um, uh, risk assessment tools. However, the most exciting result was this result suggesting that sarcopenic obesity baseline psoas fat volume being increased, that it correlates with weight loss and could be served as an MRI uh, determined biomarker of early, ca ca uh, early cachexia risk uh, stratification. Uh, uh, we, have been, uh, we have entered the SFB during the fourth uh, um, funding period, so this is some of our selected publications. There's still a lot going on uh, in terms of papers that are currently in the pipeline. Uh, this is the paper that uh, Maurice, Mauricio already highlighted in uh, the, the top journal of the field, and we have submitted the MRI also uh, study uh, for the muscle patients and also um, uh, two technical papers that are currently in the pipeline. I would like to finish by thanking also Stefan Herzig, who was not here physically present today, but he was also behind many of the activities of the project and also a copy in the project. The colleagues that uh, worked in the two sides of the team, so uh, we have been able really to perform such a study, and me to learn Cachexia and uh, Mauricio to interact about the uh, biomarkers for the imaging, only because we are able to join this joint effort. I would like to thank Professor Svage for giving me the opportunity to join uh, the SFB during the uh, fourth uh, funding period, and also the interactions we had over the years with other colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this <coughs> presentation. I'm losing my voice, sorry about that. Uh, combining, <coughs> combining biological aspects, which probably are, are the biomarkers which we typically think of with imaging aspects, mm -hmm. which probably are a new generation of biomarkers we may have to consider in the future. Are there any questions? Can you... <coughs> Nutritional support is uh, for sure important, and, and this is also something that needs to be implemented in, 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 in the care of, of cancer patients. However, it's really consensus that nutritional support is not sufficient if there is a strong cachectic drive. So this dysregulation and this uh, loss of, of energy homeostasis requires to, uh, further um, um, interventions, and, and this need to be mild exercise whenever possible to promote some anabolic signaling and, and pharmacological interventions. And unfortunately, uh, most of the clinical studies so far failed. And one reason is that uh, for, for cachexia treatment, direct treatment of cachexia, for example, granning agonists uh, centrally. Uh, and the reason is also that there is no clear idea about the endpoint of such clinical studies. And, and uh, weight loss is maybe not a very good endpoint, and there need to be further kind of uh, parameters for assessing the effects of interventions. And, and, uh, and such biomarkers could also be really useful in order to you know, monitor um, treatment uh, effects uh, and also functional assessment of, of, of the muscles. Uh, and, and there is a lot of activities, and also uh, Pfizer has a big pro program now on, on cachexia research in order to add pharmacological treatment to nutritional support and other to form kind of a multimodal treatment uh, concept that, that might help then in this respect. Did you consider use MR spectroscopy to analyze the fat composition? It's an excellent question. We wish we were able to do way more with MR. Like, so this was a prospective study where we wanted to have newly diagnosed patients. So uh, we were basically uh, used primarily as a workhorse. 
a free breathing scan with four stacks to really minimize the scan time. We have acquired one MR spectroscopy scan in a subset of patients in the subcutaneous adipose tissue. Again, scan time was critical for these patients. Many of them do not undergo MRI for their clinical part of their clinical workup, and we had to really um, uh, think very hard of how to uh, minimize uh, the scan time. So, but the, the we have this additional data, which unfortunately is in a sub cohort. I think uh, we close now the first session because, again, of time restrictions. And I hand over now to the next moderator, Helmut Mecke.